Two lanes kasi, you know, pag two lanes, na solid road mo. Then, uh, yeah. Tatayo ko pa mo. Pa Alam mo na ba?
Good afternoon, and welcome to the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology's Single Topic Conference on Severe Acute Pancreatitis. Before we begin, here are a few reminders for all attendees. Reminders. All attendees are in listening mode. It is helpful to use a two-way earphones, headset, or headphones for clearer audio input. The lecture is presented as PowerPoint slides. Please ensure that your device is in full screen mode. Your questions will be entertained after the lecture. Please use the Q&A box to type in your questions. To claim your certificate of attendance, please answer a short survey which will be emailed to you after attending the postgraduate course. We would like to invite everyone to join us in prayer. Let us put ourselves in the holy presence of God. God of all creation, giver of all gifts, we thank you for this opportunity to nourish our minds through this virtual gathering as we seek ways to be of better service as medical practitioners. Continue to guide us and help us in our duties. Bless us as we learn together and work together for one common purpose. Grant that we may always be instruments of your selfless love. All these we ask in your holy name. Amen. And now, to officially open the conference, let us all welcome the President of PSG, Dr. Augusto Jose Galang. Good afternoon to all members of the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology, as well as to all our guests. Once I heard a saying, for every problem, there is an opportunity. The COVID pandemic is indeed a serious problem that up to now the world is trying to solve. For us, it is a major obstacle in the pursuit of our common objectives in the PSG. However, with optimism and prayer, we view this current crisis as a challenge for our society to show our two important virtues, resilience and determination. Resilience because despite the swift and wide-ranging changes that this COVID has exerted on our daily lives, we have proven that we can adapt to these changes effectively and quickly. Not so long ago, we started to learn the ropes and come up with online webinars, which is a stark deviation from our conventional physical scientific meetings. Today, we are going to have our first ever virtual single topic conference. This is yet another fine example of our resilience. Another virtue that has become apparent is determination. Despite COVID, we have continued with our collective desire to train and teach our trainees, as well as educate and update our members. And for this, I would like to congratulate the Chair of the PSG Council on Pancreatic Biliary Disease, Dr. Frederick D., who is incidentally a past president of our esteemed society, for conceptualizing this single topic conference on acute severe pancreatitis. Indeed, today's scientific activity is yet another proof of our resilience and determination in the midst of serious challenges posed by COVID. Also, I would like to thank in advance everyone in the roster of invited faculty in this afternoon's STC. Truly, their contribution in sharing their time and expertise towards continuing medical education for our colleagues in the medical profession will always be appreciated today and always. I wish everyone another fruitful learning experience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Augusto Jose Galang.
Now, to give us a short overview of the course outline for this afternoon's conference is the Chair of the Council on Pancreaticobiliary Diseases. Let us all welcome Dr. Frederick D. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. As the course director of the single topic conference, I would like to formally welcome and thank everyone for joining us in this afternoon's event. Because of the very high mortality rate of severe acute pancreatitis, we thought that it's important that we learn how to manage this disease so that we can improve on the fatality, um, the, the rate of fatality of this disease, of this disorder. So the organizing committee together with me and Dr. Yvonne Mina, uh, Dr. Romel Romano and Dr. Carlos Lazaro thought that it is important that we do this in one afternoon setting. So please, um, instead of doing this separately in different parts, we thought that doing this in one afternoon might be better so that we can get the most out of the learning, the most out of the learning of what we, we will get from this uh, conference. Um, so the topic would involve from uh, the basics of severe acute pancreatitis from those individuals who are at risk of getting a severe acute pancreatitis to that of the pathophysiology, which is, a little, which is different from just the usual acute pancreatitis. How do we prognosticate these individuals? And of course, how do we medically manage them? Because we know that this disease has a lot of complications medically. And finally, how to properly give nutrition to this group of patients suffering from severe acute pancreatitis. So this first part would be um, moderated by Dr. Romel Romano. And for the second part, which would be, which will be moderated by Dr. Ivan Ong, we'll be talking more on the complications associated with severe acute pancreatitis, the local complications. This would include fistula, pseudosis, and that of pancreatic necrosis. And this is um, the proper management of this disease. When do we touch? When do we observe? It's actually very important. And which one do we use? So I'm very happy to tell you that we have a lot of speakers for this single topic conference and they were all cherry picked. Uh, we look at individuals with, uh, who are very good at what they do and they can help us out to understand better severe acute pancreatitis. With this, I, I want you to enjoy and relax, and I want you to engage yourself with questions. And um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, enjoy and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Frederick D. We will now begin with the first half of our conference. To introduce the speakers and to facilitate the Q&A sessions is our moderator. He obtained his medical degree from the University of Santo Tomas. He had his residency and fellowship training in gastroenterology and fellowship in advanced endoscopy in the University of Santo Tomas. He had his fellowship in endoscopic ultrasound at the King Chulalongkorn Memorial Hospital in Bangkok. He is an instructor five at the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery and an active consultant in the section of gastroenterology at the University of Santo Tomas Hospital. Currently, he is the chair in the Committee on Training Program and the director of the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology. Let us all welcome our first moderator, Dr. Romel Romano. Thank you very much. and. Uh... Good afternoon again to everyone. And thank you for joining us this afternoon as we actually binge on a hefty serving of uh, the latest updates on one of the most uh, dreaded GI conditions that we encounter in our clinical practice, right? We have quite the lineup of excellent speakers this afternoon, and they will be discussing, as uh, Dr. Frederick D has mentioned, everything from the basics to what are actually clinical pearls that we can use in our practice. And I'm sure this is going to help both the novice and even the experienced uh, clinicians among us in attendance this afternoon. So without further ado, 
uh, let us begin this single topic conference by calling in our first speaker. Okay, our first speaker is a full-blooded Tomasian. He completed his training in internal medicine and his fellowship in adult gastroenterology at the University of Santo Tomas Hospital, uh, where he also uh, pursued further training in advanced therapeutic endoscopy and ERCP at the same institution uh, because he is really uh, itching to do several things with his hands. Uh, he pursued other training in advanced therapeutic endoscopy uh, by exposing himself to several courses in Daegu uh, Catholic University in South Korea and he even had a grant in therapeutic endoscopy also in Kyushu University Hospital in Fukuoka. Uh, he is currently a visiting consultant at the University of St. Thomas Hospital to discuss the epidemiology and risk factors of severe acute pancreatitis. Uh, let us all wel welcome Dr. Alvin Brian Velasco. Dr. Velasco. Thank you for that kind introduction. So good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the members of the organizing committee, especially Dr. Frederick D, for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful conference. The topic assigned to me is epidemiology and risk factors of severe acute pancreatitis. This is the outline of my lecture based on the objectives given. We'll define what is severe acute pancreatitis, give some epidemiological data related to SAT, discuss the risk factors for developing SAT. We have a slide on clinical determinants of organ failure. And lastly, we'll discuss predicting organ failure in SAT. So how do we define SAT? The widely accepted definition is from the revised Atlanta criteria for acute pancreatitis published in 2012. So it divided acute pancreatitis into three categories. Mild acute, mild acute pancreatitis is defined as the absence of organ failure and or pancreatic necrosis. Moderately severe acute pancreatitis is defined as organ failure lasting less than 48 hours or only a transient organ failure and or the presence of local complications. Severe acute pancreatitis is defined as organ failure that lasts for more than 48 hours or what we call persistent organ failure. However, in some international societies, SAP is defined not only by the presence of persistent or progressive organ failure, but also with the presence of local complications. So if there are local complications, this can already be classified a severe acute pancreatitis. Since organ failure is critical in the diagnosis of SAP, so how do we define organ failure? We use the modified Marshall score for organ dysfunction. This scoring system takes into consideration three systems that are usually involved in severe diseases. So these include the respiratory, the renal, and cardiovascular system. For the respiratory, we look at the PaO2 FiO2 ratio, the renal, the serum creatinine, and for the cardiovascular system, the systolic blood pressure. A score greater than 2 in any of the systems defines organ failure. So, how do we define local complications? So, when we talk about local pancreatic complications, literature would usually focus on these two things the presence of pancreatic and peripancreatic fluid collections or necrosis. This study defines the different pancreatic complications seen in pancreatitis. Acute pancreatic fluid collection is seen within four weeks of symptom onset and pseudocyst is seen in greater than four weeks with the formation of a wall. So they both occur in interstitial edematous pancreatitis while acute necrotic collection is seen within four weeks and wall of necrosis, which is your acute necrotic collection with a wall noted greater than four weeks from symptom onset and they occur in necrotizing pancreatitis. 
Another complication, which is more commonly seen in necrotizing pancreatitis, is fistula formation. Severe acute pancreatitis has two phases. The early phase, which is the first 14 days, is characterized by systemic inflammatory response syndrome resulting from release of inflammatory mediators. The late phase, on the other hand, is dominated by sepsis-related complications from infection of pancreatic necrosis. Let's take a look at some epidemiological data related to severe acute pancreatitis. SAP occurs in 15 to 20 percent of acute pancreatitis cases. Necrotizing pancreatitis occurs in approximately 5 to 10 percent of all acute pancreatitis. Out of this 10 percent, 40 percent of them may develop organ failure. Mortality for acute pancreatitis is only 1 to 2 percent and even lower than 1 percent in some studies. But mortality for SAP can go as high as 20 to 40 percent with fulminant organ failure secondary to systemic inflammatory response syndrome as the main cause. So the following are the risk factors for severe acute pancreatitis. So we have age of greater than 60 years old, which is maybe due to the presence of coexisting conditions and physiologic changes accompanying aging. We have fragility and less cardiac and pulmonary reserves. Next, we have severe comorbidities, obesity with a BMI of greater than 30, dyslipidemia, diabetes mellitus, alcohol, smoking, and the extent of local pancreatic injury and genetic predisposition and etiology. So we will discuss some of them in further detail. The Charleston Comorbidity Index is a well-validated com comorbidity summary primarily used to predict 10-year survival in patients with multiple comorbidities. According to the study by Singe et al., a score of greater than 2 in the index is indicative of severe comorbidities. Obesity, as defined by a BMI of greater than 30, is a widely recognized risk factor for severe acute pancreatitis. Mechanisms on how obesity can cause SAP include increased inflammatory response in the pancreas with increased levels of IL-1 and IL-6. The increase in accumulation of fat within and around the pancreas, and there's also the effect of obesity on pancreatic microcirculation, which may increase the risk for ischemic injury. Obese patients were also at risk of having ventilation perfusion mismatch due to decreased inspiratory capacity due to restriction in chest wall and diaphragm movement. And lastly, the increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines noted in visceral fat so due to predominance of your adipokines, specifically leptin. In this meta-analysis, look at looking at the incidence of SAP in patients with BMI of greater than 30 versus BMI of less than 30, severe acute pancreatitis can be seen to be more common at the obese subgroup. In terms of mortality, this was also noted to be more common in the obese patients. This figure shows the effect of BMI on severity of pancreatitis and mortality. So as you can see in figure B, mortality is higher in obese and underweight individuals. For underweight individuals, this may be due to the adverse effects of malnutrition. Some studies have included BMI in the Apache 2 and BICEP scoring system and have shown improved prediction of severity of acute pancreatitis. However, this has to be further validated using larger studies. Hypertriglyceridemia increases blood viscosity, which can impair pancreatic blood circulation. Meanwhile, patients with low HDLs may produce a more severe systemic response due to the absence of anti-inflammatory benefit of your HDL. 
For diabetes mellitus, this may be due to the increased prevalence of other risk factors like obesity, dyslipidemia, and gallstones in this population. A few studies have shown the relationship of insulin resistance to acute pancreatitis through its effect on tumor necrosis alpha, your NF-kappa beta, and amylin, and the increased production of reactive oxygen species in the assigner cells. On the other hand, a good number of studies have established DM as a sequela of severe acute pancreatitis. There's no question on the important etiologic role of alcohol in acute and chronic pancreatitis. Alcohol causes precipitation and increases viscosity of pancreatic secretions. Alcohol also lowers the threshold for intrapancreatic trypsin activation and causes premature activation of trypsinogen leading to autodigestion. Acetaldehyde, which is the metabolite of alcohol, causes activation of your stellate cells, increased expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and decrease in nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, which is essential in cellular metabolism and ATP production. Alcohol was also shown to shift pancreatic cell death from apoptosis to necrosis. It also caused intracellular activation of your nuclear factor kappa beta that further drives the inflammatory response and may cause up to 50% of pancreatic tissue damage and lead to severe fatal inflammatory response. So this is also on top of the direct toxic effect of alcohol on the assigner cells. Smoking was found to be an independent factor associated with SAP in both gallstone and alcohol-induced AP. So smoking elevate levels of pancreatic cymogens it also leads to pancreatic secretory dysfunction, impaired pancreatic capillary perfusion, and upregulation of your intracellular calcium secretion, which may induce activation of your pancreatic enzymes. So smoking was also found to have an additive effect with alcohol for severe acute pancreatitis. Given the same etiology and phenotype, so why do some individuals develop only mild acute pancreatitis while others progress to severe acute pancreatitis? So this may be due to variability in inter-individual inflammatory response. Some studies have shown that genes related to trypsin activation and innate immunity appear to be associated with acute pancreatitis susceptibility and severity. TNF gene polymorphism and MCP1 gene are specifically associated with increased risk of developing severe acute pancreatitis. However, further studies are needed to prove association. The extent of local injury and systemic injury manifesting as organ failure are intimately linked. It has a bidirectional association in which pancreatic necrosis influences organ failure, and organ failure, on the other hand, exacerbates development of pancreatic necrosis, which leads to a vicious cycle. In terms of etiology, biliary or gallstone pancreatitis was found to have a milder course compared to alcoholic pancreatitis. This study by Barauskatz shows a trend towards lesser incidence of infected necrosis, lower rate of necrosectomies, shorter hospital stay, and lower mortality rate for gallstone pancreatitis. These are the clinical determinants of organ failure, the grade, the type, the number, and the timing. A higher grade of organ failure in the modified Marshall score has greater impact on the outcome. Cardiovascular system involvement leads to a worse outcome compared to other system involvement. Multi-organ failure leads also to a worse outcome than single organ failure and timing of organ failure from onset of acute pancreatitis classified into primary or secondary organ failure is also significant. Now to differentiate the two, 
this table shows us the different characteristics for primary versus secondary organ failure. Primary organ failure is related to sterile inflammation, usually seen within the first 7 to 14 days of onset of acute pancreatitis. The therapeutic window is short due to early mortality, and goal of management is usually supportive. For secondary organ failure, this is more related to the complication of infected pancreatic necrosis, usually seen after the first 7 to 14 days. There is a long therapeutic window to intervene, and goal is to control sepsis. We go now to the predictors of severe acute pancreatitis. For clinical, we consider the age, the BMI, comorbidities, and other risk factors discussed a while ago. We have the presence of systemic inflammatory response syndrome and different scoring systems that will be further discussed later by our next speaker. For laboratory predictors, we know the value of monitoring the BUN, the hematocrit of the patient. CRP with levels of more than 150 may predict a more severe course. We now have laboratories that can measure interleukin levels, specifically 6, 8, and 10. In one study, combination of SIRS and IL-6 levels has a positive predictive value of 85% and specificity of 95% for severe acute pancreatitis. Procalcitonin has also been found to be a good predictor of pancreatic necrosis. Well, an important reminder, the degree of elevation of your amylase and lipase has no predictive or prognostic value. So even if you have a value of thousands, it doesn't mean the patient has severe pancreatitis. For radiologic predictors, so we look for complications like infiltrates or pleural effusion on chest x-ray, but more important is the contrast-enhanced CT scan to look for local complications as described in the CT severity index. So this boils down to the most important question. Can we really predict organ failure? Unfortunately, there is no single parameter that can predict the development of organ failure. So we still need to consider the patient characteristics, the laboratory, and imaging findings as a whole. This was lifted from the American College of Gastroenterology Guidelines on Management of Acute Pancreatitis, emphasizing the best way to predict a severe course of pancreatitis is to consider all these findings, the clinical, the laboratory, and radiologic data. In conclusion, severe acute pancreatitis occurs in 15 to 20 percent of acute pancreatitis cases. The mortality can go as high as 40%. So we have discussed the risk factors for severe acute pancreatitis. There is no single parameter that can predict development of organ failure in severe acute pancreatitis. So for my parting words to echo ACG, so it's not wise to dismiss acute pancreatitis cases as mild within the first 48 hours. A good number of these cases may eventually progress to severe acute pancreatitis. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Velasco, for your lecture. Uh, what a way to start our afternoon. All right, so may I remind everyone again uh, that if you have any questions for our speakers, you may use the Q&A box and type in your questions uh, because uh, I'm afraid we will not have enough time for us to allow you to use the microphone and then um, uh, ask your questions using your mics. So if we have any question, so Dr. Velasco, let me begin uh, the first question. Um, uh, thank you for enumerating for us and giving us again uh, a list of the uh, uh, risk factors for severe acute pancreatitis, but have you encountered like figures on the incidence perhaps of severe acute pancreatitis among patients with no apparent risk factors? 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Romano, for that question. Uh, remind me next time, uh, I will volunteer as a moderator on your next lecture. <laughs> so, uh, in terms of studies on the incidents, uh, so there, I haven't encountered any studies that look at the incidence of severe acute pancreatitis without risk factors. So one, uh, all the studies on the risk factors up to now are still evolving. So some of them needed further tests, further evaluation to prove really the association between the, that risk factor and the development of your SAP. And uh, next is, uh, I think it's very difficult to really label uh, someone to have totally no risk factor. No? So aside from the clinical, there's still the etiology, the possibility of the genetic variability. So it's really difficult now to say totally there's no risk factor for this case. Now, uh, just want maybe to share, uh, I had this case before, he's only a 28 year old male who died of severe acute pancreatitis. So uh, unfortunately this patient, um, he has no comorbidities. Um, he's relatively young, but uh, patient arrived at the emergency room already hypotensive. And the patient was already, uh, was already having symptoms five days ago. So I don't know, no? maybe if we have catch this patient early, so maybe the outcome would have been different. You know? So to answer the question, if can we develop severe acute pancreatitis even without risk factors, then I guess the answer is yes. Okay, so, so I think Dr. Velasco is trying to highlight that probably we really need to get a, a very good accurate history for our patients, especially those presenting with severe acute pancreatitis uh, even at the very onset of the presentation of the disease. And um, uh, there's one question in the Q&A box. Um, can you comment, Dr. Velasco, on uh, drug-induced uh, pancreatitis? Of course, that's a very important um, uh, etiology of acute pancreatitis as well. So, and his, his um, example is linagliptin. Yes, yes. Uh, I, uh, I read a study on... This one, also the drug-induced uh, pancreatitis. However, uh, in terms of the association between the these drugs and the development of severe acute pancreatitis, uh, there's no question. A lot of drugs can cause acute pancreatitis. So this one is known. But uh, the focus is on the development of severe acute pancreatitis. And unfortunately, um, to now, there's really no correlation between uh, this certain drugs, and severe acute pancreatitis. But there's no question in terms of acute pancreatitis. All right. Thank you very much again. So again, uh, I will, uh, in the interest of time, we need to move to the next speaker. But if you have other questions for Dr. Velasco, you may still type them in the Q&A box and we'll, we'll try to get uh, and answer your questions as soon as we get them. Okay. okay. Thank you again, Dr. Thank Velasco. You. Thank you very so, much. Let me introduce the next speaker. All right. Our next speaker is an alumna of the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Medicine and Surgery, and she completed her residency and fellowship training uh, in gastroenterology at the St. Luke's Medical Center in Quezon City. Uh, she is currently the um, Training Officer of the Section of Gastroenterology at the St. Luke's Medical Center in BGC. And um, she's one of my Lodi in research. And it shows, uh, her love of research shows, and she's still a member of the research committee of the Department of Medicine at the St. Luke's Medical Center in BGC. And she's currently one of the, uh, his, she's the associate editor of the Philippine Journal of Gastroenterology uh, to talk about uh, several scoring systems, uh, grading the severity and prognosticating SAP. Uh, let's all give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Marie Antoinette Lonto. Dr. Lonto. Good afternoon. I am tasked to fulfill the following objectives. 
enumerate the different scoring systems for grading severity and prognosticating severe acute pancreatitis. Compare the different grading systems for severity of acute pancreatitis and evaluate which prognosticating variable or scoring systems may be most helpful. In the 2018 American Gastroenterological Association guidelines in the management of acute pancreatitis, it is defined as an inflammatory condition of the pancreas that can cause local injury, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, and organ failure. Diagnosis requires at least two of the following, the characteristic abdominal pain, amylase or lipase elevation more than three times above normal, and or evidence of pancreatitis on contrast-enhanced CT scan, and less commonly with the use of MRI or transabdominal ultrasound. The management depends on etiology, severity, and available technology and skills in the institution. According to the 2012 revised Atlanta classification, the severity of acute pancreatitis can be divided into three, mild, which is absence of organ failure and local or systemic complications, moderately severe, as transient organ failure or local or systemic complications, and severe pancreatitis defined as presence of persistent organ failure. Local complications include pancreatic necrosis, acute fluid collections, pseudocyst, acute necrotic collections, and walled-off necrosis. With a focus on organ failure, organ failure was defined based on the modified Marshall scoring system. A score of more than or equal to 2 for more than 48 hours was considered as persistent organ failure, whereas if present for less than 48 hours, it was considered as transient organ failure. Organ failure was characterized as systolic blood pressure below 90 mm mercury, PaO2 of less than 60 mm mercury, creatinine of at least 2 mg per deciliter, and presence of GI bleeding amounting to 500 ml or more in 24 hours. Acute pancreatitis can rapidly progress into moderately severe or severe acute pancreatitis. In the absence of standard care of treatment, early clinical recognition of acute pancreatitis is crucial to managing disease progression. Evidence shows that after the initial 48 to 72 hours, the progression of disease may be fully established, leading to multi-system organ failure. However, early identification of patients at risk of developing severe acute pancreatitis remains a great challenge. Assessing persistent organ failure and death are important beyond 48 hours after admission. So what should an ideal predictor be? It should be rapid, reproducible, inexpensive, minimally invasive, and highly accurate. Predictors can be based on clinical parameters, laboratory parameters, and radiographic findings. Among the clinical predictors of severe acute pancreatitis, older age has been shown in several studies as a predictor of worse prognosis. In an illustrative study, Patients older than 75 years had more than 15-fold greater chance of dying within 2 weeks and more than 22-fold greater chance of dying within 91 days compared with patients aged 35 years or younger. Alcohol as a cause of pancreatitis has been associated with an increased risk of pancreatic necrosis and need for intubation. A time interval between the onset of symptoms and hospital admission of less than 24 hours, as well as presence of rebound tenderness and or guarding were associated with increasing severity of pancreatitis. Another important clinical predictor is obesity, defined as body mass index of more than 30. A meta-analysis that included 739 patients show that obesity pretend higher odds of severe acute pancreatitis, systemic complications, local complications, and death. Occurrence of early and persistent organ failure is a reliable indicator of prolonged hospital stay and increased mortality. 
In one report, organ failure within 72 hours of admission was associated with the presence of extended pancreatic necrosis and a mortality rate of 42%. Further, several studies found that the evolution and clinical course of organ failure was a more accurate predictor of adverse outcomes. Persistent and deteriorating organ failure more than 48 hours were associated with mortality rates of 21 to 55 percent. On the other hand, early organ dysfunction that was not persistent or have lasted less than 48 hours was associated with a mortality rate of 0 to 1.4 percent. Acute pancreatitis results in significant third space losses resulting in hemoconcentration and a high hematocrit. Levels of CRP may discriminate severe from mild disease. CRP rises steadily in relation to the severity of pancreatitis. It's inexpensive to measure and testing is readily available. For every increase in BUN of 5 mg per deciliter during the first 24 hours, the adjusted odds ratio for mortality was 2.2. An elevated serum creatinine within the first 48 hours may predict the development of pancreatic necrosis. Procalcitonin is the most rapid general acute phase reactant. In a validation study, the procalcitonin strip test had an accuracy of 86% for predicting severe acute pancreatitis. Trypsinogen activation peptide is cleaved from the amino terminal end of trypsinogen the trypsin is activated and may be useful prognosticator. However, this is not readily available in the country. The presence of pleural effusion and or pulmonary infiltrates during the first 24 hours may be associated with necrosis and organ failure. Contrast-enhanced CT scan is currently the modality of choice to look for pancreatic necrosis and extrapancreatic inflammation. MRI or MRCP appears to be comparable to CT, if not better, in providing precise information regarding the severity of the disease. It can also characterize the pancreatic necrosis and detect pancreatic duct disruption. Currently, there are several scoring systems developed over the years, from Ransons, which was developed in the 1970s, to new biomarkers. There are at least 17 scoring systems developed for acute pancreatitis. This shows us the absence of a gold standard to help assess and prognosticate disease severity in acute pancreatitis. Four frequently used scoring systems for early identification of severe acute pancreatitis or SAP include the Ransom score, Acute Physiology and Chronic Health Evaluation, or PACHI, the Bedside Index of Severity in Acute Pancreatitis, or BISAP, and the Glasgow IMRI score. The CTSI and the Modified Computed Tomography Severity Index, or MCTSI, Harmless Acute Pancreatitis Score, are used beyond 48 hours of admission to assess and prognosticate disease severity. It is widely accepted that early intervention and intensive care can decrease the mortality of SAP. Therefore, it is important to predict the severity and mortality of acute pancreatitis patients at an early stage. When SAP is considered, patients should be immediately transferred to an intensive care unit for early intervention and to ensure the maintenance of organ function and reduce mortality. Several biomarkers have been studied to help in prognosticating risks in acute pancreatitis. Ransom's criteria is one of the earliest scoring systems to assess the severity of acute pancreatitis and continue to be widely used. It was originally created in 1974 for assessing alcohol-induced pancreatitis and modifications done in 1979 for gallstone pancreatitis called the modified Ransons criteria. There are 11 parameters determined with the original Ransons and 10 with the exclusion of PaO2 for the modified criteria. A score of 3 or more predict 
severe acute pancreatitis, and possible mortality. This Glasgow Amber score was developed in the 1980s prior to significant advances in the treatment and evaluation of pancreatitis, including advanced imaging. It predicts severity of pancreatitis at 48 hours after admission. It includes eight laboratory criteria plus age. A score of three or more predicts severe pancreatitis. The Apache scoring system is widely used in the United States, of which there are four versions, Apache 1 through 4. Although Apache 4 is the more up-to-date version, due to the need for more variables or parameters, some centers still use older versions, including Apache 2. It has 12 physiologic measures and extra points based upon age and presence of chronic disease. Apache score of 8 and higher is considered SAP. However, it is very cumbersome for routine clinical use. In 2008, the Bedside Index for Severity of Acute Pancreatitis or BICEP score was proposed for the early recognition of patients at risk of mortality. This 5-point scoring system is comprised of 5 variables, BUN, impaired mental status, development of systemic inflammatory response syndrome, age more than 60 years, and presence of pleural effusion. Compared with the other traditional scoring systems, BICEP is more convenient to use with fewer items. BICEP score of more than 2 predicts 15% risk of death. However, a meta-analysis on BICEP done in 2016 showed that BICEP score was not an ideal single method for assessing the severity of acute pancreatitis because of its low sensitivity. It is important to understand that imaging is not indicated to assess a patient with mild acute pancreatitis unless the patient is suspected of having a malignancy. However, a CT scan of the abdomen is always indicated in patients with severe acute pancreatitis and is the imaging modality of choice in patients to check for complications. The CT scan is rarely needed within the first three days of admission unless the diagnosis is in doubt because most inflammatory alterations are often not visible on the scan early on. The CTSI or balthazar ranson criteria is a sum of two scores, the Balthasar score and the rating for the extent of pancreatic necrosis. Score above 7 is predictive of severe acute pancreatitis. However, it has been shown that complications like organ failure do not correlate well with the score given by the original CTSI. Modified CTSI was then introduced to improve the staging of acute pancreatitis. It is a simplified assessment of pancreatic inflammation being graded as 0 for normal, 2 for pancreatic changes with or without peripancreatic stranding, 4 for peripancreatic fluid collection or peripancreatic fat necrosis, and presence of pancreatic necrosis graded as 0 if none, 2 if less than 30% necrosis, 4 if more than 30%. It is also able to evaluate the presence of extra pancreatic complications. Again, Necrosis becomes evident two to three days after the initial clinical onset of symptoms. There are several organ failure-based scoring systems. All these scores take into account the number of organ systems involved and the degree of dysfunction of each individual. SOFA score is tedious to do, especially at the emergency unit. The simplified version, or the quick SOFA, involves only three parameters. QSOFA is a tool originally designed to identify patients at high risk of mortality due to sepsis. A score based upon the systemic inflammatory response syndrome has been used in acute pancreatitis. Initial studies suggest that it can reliably predict the severity of pancreatitis and has the added advantage that it can be applied easily at the bedside every day. In one validation study, mortality rates were 25, 8, and 0% in those with persistent sears from admission, 
those with serious at admission but not persistent, and those with no signs or symptoms of SEERS. It appears that the SEERS score is inexpensive to do and can be done at bedside daily. In a study in 2019 comparing SEERS and QSOFA, the study showed that SEERS performed better than QSOFA. But how do the different scoring systems perform against each other? A study comparing early assessment at 48 hours after admission using Ransons and Glasgow showed that Ransons had a higher sensitivity, negative predictive value, or NPV, and diagnostic odds ratio for predicting severity of acute pancreatitis. In the early assessment of acute pancreatitis severity, a study comparing BICEP and Apache 2 showed that Apache 2 was a significantly stronger predictor of disease severity than the BICEP score. A study comparing four commonly used scoring systems, the receiver operating curves which capture the sensitivity and specificity of each scoring system is shown here. The higher the curve or nearer to one, the better. In the study done in 2012, Ransom's scoring system, whether on admission, which is the yellow line on top, or at 48 hours, performed better than the Apache, Glasgow, and BICEP scoring systems. What is the utility of the biologic markers in acute? What is the utility of the biologic markers in acute pancreatitis? C-reactive protein is an acute phase reactant produced by the liver in response to interleukin-1. It is the most widely available, has low cost, and well studied by chemical marker of severity in acute pancreatitis. A CRP level greater than 6 at 24 hours or greater than 7 at 48 hours are consistent with severe acute pancreatitis. Double figures more than 10 mg per deciliter strongly indicates severe pancreatitis. Procalcitonin is a propeptide of the hormone calcitonin, which is released by hepatocytes, peripheral monocytes, and G cells of the thyroid gland. PCT level can be measured by a semi-quantitative strip test for fast results or by a fully automated assay to obtain a more accurate measurement. However, it is expensive and not readily available. An increased PCT level has been found to be an early predictor of severity, pancreatic necrosis, and organ failure in patients with acute pancreatitis. In this study done in 2013, IL-6 was specifically compared to the different scoring systems and to CRP. IL-6 seemed to perform very well across the different outcomes. However, this is not readily available in the country. Ranson and Apache 2 scores were the next best predictors of severe acute pancreatitis and mortality. CTSI and Ranson were the best in predicting pancreatic necrosis. CRP also consistently performed well across the three parameters. Current practice guidelines have suggested that the Apache 2 score was the most helpful test at admission in distinguishing severe from mild acute pancreatitis. And according to recommendation, it should be generated during the first three days of hospitalization. Although the process of calculating Apache 2 score was complex, it might be easier in the era of easily accessible and convenient computing apps. Among the traditional scoring systems, in predicting SAP, Ransons and Glasgow have high negative predictive value. What does this number mean? This means a low score from any of these scoring systems would reliably detect patients at low risk for severe pancreatitis and or death. Ransom has a higher AUC than Glasgow. Though many see that the requirement for 48 hours to complete the assessment as a general limitation, some studies suggest that 48-hour time frame is essential to accurately predict severity. Thus, this might be their inherent strength rather than weakness because disease progression typically manifests 
within 48 to 72 hours of admission. Recommendations by the recent Atlanta Symposium similarly endorse the 48-hour time frame for severity stratification, highlighting the importance of prognosticating acute pancreatitis accurately rather than prematurely, in keeping with the underlying pathophysiology of acute pancreatitis as a disease in evolution that requires daily review for severity reassessment. While these different scoring systems cannot replace clinical judgment, they have value in providing objective stratification in doubtful cases, providing means for standardized reporting and auditing, and providing a platform for patient communication and future research. Thus, further studies are needed before traditional scoring systems are considered outdated and obsolete. What do the guidelines say? The American College of Gastroenterology does not recommend a single scoring system as a standalone to stratify risk and predict mortality. The AGA guidelines recommend the clinical, laboratory, and radiographic findings associated with a severe course for the initial risk assessment. Patient characteristics include age, BMI more than 30, altered mental status, and comorbid illness. Presence of Sear syndrome, as defined in this slide. Important laboratory findings such as high and rising hematocrit, high and rising BUN, and elevated creatinine as markers of hemoconcentration, dehydration, and third space loss. Radiologic findings to determine local pancreatic complication and extrapancreatic involvement. Depending on the particular outcome parameter of interest, Ransons or modified Ransons depending on etiology, Apache and CRP within the first 24 to 48 hours have modest accuracy in predicting severe acute pancreatitis. Ransons and Apache 2 perform well in predicting mortality from SAP. In determining organ failure and need for ICU admission, Apache, Sears, and Procalcitonin are good predictors. Modified CTSI is the best performing in determining local complications and extra pancreatic complication. AGA recommends assessing all patients with severe acute pancreatitis with contrast enhanced CT scan or MRI. The optimal timing for the first CT assessment is 72 to 96 hours after symptom onset. What then is the most useful and feasible scoring system for us to use? Based on the review of existing data on these scoring systems, ransoms should be part of the initial assessment on admission and at 48 hours due to modest and reliable accuracy in predicting severe acute pancreatitis, need for ICU admission, risk for pancreatic necrosis, and mortality. CRP may be requested to improve the capacity to predict for severe pancreatitis and organ failure. Apache should ideally be done to predict disease progression, organ failure, and mortality if possible. CT or MRI should be requested more than 72 hours of admission among patients with severe pancreatitis to determine local and possible extra pancreatic complications. No single instrument has convincingly proven superiority to another in its ability to assess risk for severe acute pancreatitis and predict death. None is recognized as a criterion standard. Thus, Combination of one or more of these scoring systems and markers as disease evolves will serve to help clinicians to better manage patients with severe acute pancreatitis. Other than feasibility and ease of use, cost, individual preference, and available institutional facilities influence the method chosen for prognostic assessment of acute pancreatitis. Thank you and Merry Christmas in advance. Thank you very much, Dr. Alontok, for your excellent lecture. Um, 
in the interest of time, probably we can entertain only one question. And I think this is very important that we uh, discuss this live. Uh, the question uh, from one of the participants is, do you routinely order lab tests to prognosticate patients on admission or only when they deteriorate? Well, I based it on the clinical parameters, okay? If the, in the um, initial laboratory parameters, the one we check for like creatinine, the BUN, okay? If there's significant hemoconcentration or possibility of an AKI, then um, you have to watch these patients more closely and probably start prognosticating or doing your scoring systems. But for patients who are low risk, in terms of age, in terms of etiology, straightforward cases. We don't. I don't usually um, request all these uh, laboratories to prognosticate. But uh, in terms of scoring systems, I use Ranson and also CRP. All right. So uh, while I think in the latter part of your lecture, you already mentioned that in the U.S. they are advocating that at least the parameters for ransoms be done on admission. But of course, we need to be more discerning and uh, practical in our setting. So we need to, I, I think you also mentioned this in one of uh, your slides that while there are existing uh, parameters that we can use, uh, we still need to uh, use our clinical acumen in determining who, 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 who will probably okay. deteriorate or not. Right? But of course, a clinical monitoring is of utmost importance. Okay, thank you again, Dr. Lontok, but unfortunately, we have to move on. Again, uh, you may still type your questions for any of our speakers uh, in the Q&A box, but we will now be proceeding uh, and when moving on to the next speaker. Okay, so our next speaker is a graduate of the Manila Central University uh, hospital, and he took his residency training in internal medicine at the Cardinal Santos Medical Center, and uh, he proceeded uh, with his gastroenterology fellowship at the UERM, uh, where he then uh, just recently uh, vacated the post of the a training officer of the section of gastroenterology. Uh, he has an affinity uh, for the pancreatic or biliary diseases, and he underwent uh, ERCP training at the University of Santo Tomas Hospital, and true to form to discuss the pathophysial of uh, severe acute pancreatitis, and again, true to form to his being a member of the specialty board of the PSG and PSDE, let us all uh, give a virtual welcome to Dr. Gentry D. Thank you, Dr. Ome. Um... Let me share my screen. Okay. All right. So um, good afternoon to everybody. Again, thank you, Dr. Amen, for the kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the organizing committee for a successful and well thought of single topic convention on severe acute pancreatitis. Although I don't know if I should thank Dr. Derek D for giving me a difficult topic to discuss with you. Anyway, I will try to do my best to keep you awake and to make this talk as simple as possible. I have nothing to disclose for this lecture Acute pancreatitis remains to be an elusive disease. Although we have seen that it has caused significant morbidity and mortality, treatment still remains to be supportive. The main reason being that there are still a lot of gaps in our understanding on the pathogenesis of acute pancreatitis. And through the years, these gaps have been slowly uncovered with animal studies, primarily because we cannot get human pancreatic tissues during an acute attack of pancreatitis. At the end of the lecture, I hope to be able to increase your awareness on the overall pathophysiology of acute pancreatitis and the mechanisms that may lead to the development of severe pancreatitis. By doing so, hopefully new treatment strategies or medicines may be developed 
to prevent severe acute pancreatitis from happening. Dr. Velasco has already mentioned uh, this earlier in his like, lecture. And uh, at the top of the list for the development of acute pancreatitis is gallstone and alcohol. Assigner cell toxins like alcohol, nicotine, bile acids, trigger cellular events that leads to acute pancreatitis. On the other hand, intraductal events such as increased pressure caused by ductal obstruction luminal acidification, ductal cell exposure to bile acid also triggers events that's, that leads to the development of acute pancreatitis. So before we proceed, and to make sure you are still awake, I have a poll question for you. Uh, may we have the poll question? What is considered the central event in the development of acute pancreatitis? Is it a, premature uh, trypsinogen activation within the assigner cells, pathological calcium signaling, mitochondrial dysfunction, and the plasmic reticulum stress or impaired autophagy. Can we ask the participants to click in their answers? Okay, all right. So 90% says premature trypsinogen activation within the assigner cells and a few mentioned impaired autophagy. Thank you, thank you. So as a review, we recall that trypsinogen enters the small intestine and is converted to active trypsin. This active trypsin acts with two other principal digestive proteinases, namely pepsin and chymotrypsin, to break down dietary protein into peptides and amino acids. This was what was taught to us in medical school. Now, when there is a premature activation of trypsinogen in the pancreas, this causes autodigestion of the pancreas leading to pancreatitis. This is um, what they taught us. But advances, but because of recent advances, it was found out that there are other cellular events that leads to acute pancreatitis, namely pathological calcium signaling, mitochondrial dysfunction, ER stress, impaired unfolded protein response, and in impaired autophagy. And we will discuss some of these in the next few slides. As shown in this slide, Imagine that this is your assigner cell. And we see here that alcohol and other pancreatic toxins increases synthesis of lysosomes and digestive enzymes, as well as impair zymogen granule apical exocytosis into, in the assigner cells. This process results in the accumulation of zymogen granules. These two events culminate in colocalization in which lysosomes and zymogen granules fuse. Catepsin B, which are found in lysosomes, activates trypsinogen to trypsin once colocalization occurs. Tumor necrosis factor can also cause premature trypsinogen activation by, activ by activating the TNF receptor. Both catepsin B and trypsin are released into the cytosol, and this leads to activation of apoptosis, as well as cell membrane rupture and necrosis. But in reality, the central event in acute pancreatitis based on recent studies is the pathological elevation of calcium concentration in assigner cells, because this mediates uh, this mediates pro-cell death and pro-inflammatory -infl pathways, such as premature trypsinogen activation, activation of your nuclear factor kappa B, and mitochondrial dysfunction. In a physiologic state, calcium is released from the endoplasmic reticulum as part of a signaling mechanism that initiates 
zymogen exocytosis and stimulates production of ATP in the mitochondria. However, the increase in cytosolic calcium concentration is only transient as two ATP-dependent calcium channels rapidly clear the cytosolic calcium. Okay? They are the smooth endoplasmic reticulum calcium channels, which moves calcium back into the endoplasmic reticulum, and the plasma membrane calcium channels, which causes calcium to go out of the assigner cell. However, in the presence of alcohol, polycystokinin, bile acid, this causes inositol triphosphate receptor mediated calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum. The resulting low calcium concentration in the endoplasmic reticulum triggers opening of calcium release activated calcium channel protein one, through which calcium enters the cell from the extracellular space. This results in pathological global calcium concentration elevation, which results in mitochondrial dysfunction, leading to ATP depletion, and then this impairs the ATP-dependent mechanisms to reduce cytosolic calcium back to normal. This process then accentuates and perpetuates the pathological calcium toxicity. Pathological calcium elevation also causes other cytotoxic pathways, including premature trypsinogen activation, autophagy impairment, and activation of nuclear factor kappa B. We have been mentioning NFKB, and this is important because this leads to production of pro-inflammatory mediators, which we will discuss further later. Piezo mechanoreceptor, which contains cation channel properties, is activated by pressure, also promotes increased calcium entry from outside the assigner cells. In assigner cells, toxins such as alcohol causes increased demand of protein synthesis, mitochondrial dysfunction, and impaired autophagy. These events results in endoplasmic reticulum stress which occurs when demand for protein synthesis and buildup of misfolded or unfolded proteins in a cell overwhelm the endoplasmic reticulum capacity to process them. It eventually promotes cell death and inflammation during prolonged ER stress. The past events show that there is an interplay between each other causing acute pancreatitis. But the question remains, why does a patient develop acute pancreatitis? To answer that question, allow me to discuss this slide, which shows that injured assigner cells from whatever etiology produces cytokines, hemokines, and addition molecules to recruit immune cells to the site of injury. Once recruited, chemokines and cytokines from the assigner cells and damage associated molecular patterns activate immune cells to amplify an inflammatory response. Pathways activated within monocytes include again NFKB. The initially activated monocytes can also activate monocytes in other organs causing remote organ injury, as seen in severe acute pancreatitis. Neutrophils cause premature trypsinogen activation and oxidative stress to the assigner cells by releasing ox oxidizing substances. Neutrophils also release neutrophil extracellular traps, which cause ductal obstruction, premature trypsinogen activation, and inflammation. This causes a vicious cycle of damaging the assigner cell and causing more inflammatory responses, which will eventually lead to multi-organ failure. To prove the role of pro-inflammatory mediators in acute pancreatitis, 
This paper, published in 2007, found that there is truly an elevation of interleukin-6 in patients with acute pancreatitis, and that the elevated interleukin-6 could predict organ failure and severe pancreatitis with a sensitivity of 81.8% and 77.7% respectively. And this was further strengthened by a meta-analysis by Zhang, published in Pancreatology 2009, wherein they analyzed 10 studies and concluded that interleukin-6 has a sensitivity of 81 to 83% and a specificity of 75 to 85.3%. Imagine if we can use these findings and be able to predict who among our patients will develop severe acute pancreatitis. We might be able to decrease mortality due to severe acute pancreatitis. Let's take a look now at tumor necrosis factor and its role in acute pancreatitis. Tumor necrosis factor is an early onset pro-inflammatory cytokine that triggers synthesis of a wide range of other pro-inflammatory mediators. It also directly injures the cells of multiple organs, causing ischemia, hemorrhage, necrosis, inflammation, and edema. We would expect that this would be elevated in patients with severe acute pancreatitis. This has been shown in some studies. However, in this paper by Surbatovic in 2013, they found out that TNF concentration was in fact lower in patients with multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. And they also found out that TNF was lower in those who did not survive compared to the survivors of severe acute pancreatitis. Clearly these findings conflict each other and we still need further studies to be able to really understand acute pancreatitis. So for our next poll question, just to make sure that you are still awake, okay, can we have the next poll question? Do you think that the human body has a way to counteract the inflammatory processes induced by infection? Okay, congratulations. Almost all of you answered yes. Thank you. On the next couple of slides, we will shift our attention to inflammation and sears. It is known that inflammation can be triggered in two main ways, either by infection with pathogens like bacteria or by products of tissue destruction such as what we see in acute pancreatitis. The immune system is designed to recognize and react to either dead tissue or pathogens. And what follows is an expansion and activation of several immune cell lines as we have uh, shown earlier, such as polymorphonuclears, uh, nucleosides, and lymphocytes, stimulated by the pro-inflammatory cytokines and tumor necrosis factor. The presence of these cytokines also leads to other clinical manifestations of infection, such as fever, capillary leak, vasodilation, and the expression of heat shock proteins. However, in patients with SEERS, why is it that we find reduction of lymphocytes, decreased cytokine response of monocytes, Decreased number of HLA antigen presenting receptors on monocytes. Expression of cytokines that uh, suppress TNF expression. And because of these findings that are apparently contrary to what we should expect in patients with SEERS, the theory on compensatory anti-inflammatory response syndrome became more and more accepted. This is again the body's way of maintaining balance as far as the immune system is concerned. Unfortunately, it was also found out that during this anti-inflammatory response period, patients with acute pancreatitis 
became more susceptible to developing infection of pancreatic necrosis and therefore worsening the course of the disease. We will discuss this further in a short while. If we look at the levels of interleukin-10 in patients with acute pancreatitis, it was found out that these levels are increased on the first day of the illness. Now, interleukin-10 is a uh, mediator that decreases TNF uh, production. This shows that the compensatory mechanism is already working as early as the first few days of the disease. Interestingly, it has been shown in this paper by Pezzili in 1997 that the levels are lower in those who develop severe acute pancreatitis and suggests that there may be an altered downregulation of the immune system response in these patients. The natural expectation is when SEERS develops, compensatory anti-inflammatory response syndrome also follows afterwards to maintain balance. However, Sandler in their paper is suggesting a shift in this concept, concluding that SEERS and CARS appear parallel to each other or at the same time in patients with pancreatitis. Whether this is true or not, we continue to discover new events or conflicting results that make us realize that there is still a lot we do not know about severe acute pancreatitis. In summary, all these events create a vicious cycle of more assigner cell injury that leads to accumulation of pro-inflammatory mediators and cytokines. This eventually leads to severe acute pancreatitis. And finally, we are just beginning to understand the role of CARS in the development of severe acute pancreatitis. And hopefully in the future, with better understanding of the different processes involved in the development of severe acute pancreatitis, we can, be able to under, we can be able to decrease morbidity and mortality from this dreadful disease. These are my other references. And before we end, allow me to quote a Bible passage found in Ecclesiastes 8. These are the words from King Solomon who said, No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. There are still lots of things we don't know and understand with severe acute pancreatitis. And even with advances in science and technology, we might never be able to completely understand severe acute pancreatitis. With that, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Gentry D for taking us back to med school. And I'm, I'm actually shocked that there are not many questions uh, for you on, uh, uh, on your topic. Uh, but there's actually one question from Dr. Banyes. And Dr. Banyes is asking, um, uh, what is the pathophysio of acute pancreatitis after a, coronary, uh, a cardiopulmonary bypass surgery? Um, Dr. Gentry. Yes, thank you, Dr. Banyas, for that uh, question. Um, in, in the Philippine Heart Center where I'm affiliated, we see a lot of patients with this problem. Okay? Um, not only bypass patients, but also patients who underwent, uh, who are uh, post uh, arrest. Okay? So I, I think ischemia has a role in these patients. Remember that uh, when they do bypass surgery, they uh, the blood flow of the system goes to a uh, perfusion machine. So I think there is some, in a way, ischemia that has uh, uh, affected the pancreas in these uh, um, patients. No? But uh, again, um, we, 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 we need more uh, studies on this to document um, this um, from happening. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. D. I um, actually like the way you ended uh, your talk saying that we have yet really to understand 
the nature of acute pancreatitis. But uh, since there are no other questions here in the box, can, can you just give an educated guess perhaps? Uh, when you started your talk, you said that probably in understanding the pathophysio, it will help us come up with better ways to manage more effectively and much more efficiently acute pancreatitis. Can you venture a guess uh, as to probably what, what's, what's next in store for pancreatitis as far as pharmacologic intervention is concerned? Um, well, at the tail end of my lecture, I mentioned on the compensatory anti-inflammatory response. No? Uh, I, I think um, that's the future of uh, acute pancreatitis knowing the balance of uh, SEERS and CARS. And that, uh, as I mentioned also, CARS, um, they, they, the, the, if CARS is over, uh, overactive, if the anti-inflammatory uh, process is, uh, becomes overactive, then the, uh, the, the patient may become um, uh, what you call uh, susceptible to infection. And we know that uh, infection is also uh, part and parcel of uh, severe acute pancreatitis. Uh, Dr. Ang's question on COVID and acute pancreatitis, uh, I think there are already case reports on that. Um, but because I also mentioned that um, it's difficult to get pancreatic tissues on humans during acute pancreatitis. No? So um, it's going to be very difficult to answer that question. But uh, in my slide on SEERS, uh, maybe uh, the COVID virus in itself has an affinity to the assigner cells. You know? the, this is one of the, um, um, uh, what they're uh, looking at, sir. Okay, so I think that's uh, all the time that we have for Dr. Gentry D's topic. But uh, I will still invite everyone to type in their questions if ever you do have them. So we will uh, go to our next speaker. All right. So our next uh, speaker is an alumna of the University of Santo Tomas, uh, Faculty of Medicine and Surgery. And she had her residency and tr uh, fellowship training in gastroenterology at the St. Luke's Medical Center in Quezon City. She also had her training at uh, the Royal Adelaide Hospital in Adelaide, South Australia. Uh, she is um, one of the most vibrant uh, people I know. Uh, she is uh, current, um, currently a member of the specialty board of the PSG and PSDE. Uh, she is a past president of the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology and currently an active consultant at the St. Luke's Medical Center in Quezon City uh, to discuss the management standards in management of uh, acute pancreatitis. Let us all welcome Dr. Judith Gapasin. Dr. Gapasin. Good afternoon. Thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Romano. I'd like to thank the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology, specifically my classmate, Dr. Frederick D., for giving me the opportunity to join you this weekend for this single topic conference on severe acute pancreatitis. I have no disclosure for this particular topic. My objectives are as follows. Discuss based on evidence the current standards in the management of severe acute pancreatitis, explain the potential sequelae of endocrine insufficiency of severe acute pancreatitis. I believe that there are topics in here that have been discussed before this and some topics that will be discussed afterwards. Hence, I will be adjusting my talk accordingly. Acute pancreatitis represents a disease that is characterized by acute inflammation of the pancreas and histologically assigner cell destruction. The diagnosis of acute pancreatitis requires the presence of two of the following three criteria, abdominal pain that is consistent with the disease, biochemical evidence of acute pancreatitis, specifically serum amylase and or lipase greater than three times the upper limit of normal, and characteristic findings on abdominal imaging. We classify acute pancreatitis as interstitial edematous acute pancreatitis or necrotizing acute pancreatitis. Severity is classified as mild, moderate, or severe. The mild form has no organ failure, 
local, or system complications, and it usually resolves in the first week. Moderate if there is transient, meaning less than 48 hours organ failure, local complications, or exacerbation of comorbid diseases. Severe if there is persistent or more than 48 hours organ failure. There are several classification systems that categorizes the severity of acute pancreatitis. In this study by Chen et al., they found that revised Atlanta classification and the determinant-based classification severity categories accurately reflected clinical outcomes and were superior to Atlanta 1992 in terms of evaluating mortality, ICU admission, and ICU length of stay. Severe acute pancreatitis is associated with persistent organ failure, be it cardiovascular, respiratory, and or renal, and a high mortality. Both new classification systems, the revised Atlanta classification and the determinant-based classification of acute pancreatitis severity, are similar in establishing the diagnosis and severity of acute pancreatitis. The severe form, comprising about 20 to 30 percent of patients, is a life-threatening disease with a hospital mortality rate of about 15 percent. Infection of the pancreatic and peripancreatic necrosis occurs in about 20 to 40 percent of patients with severe acute pancreatitis, and it is associated with worsening organ dysfunctions. In a systematic review and meta-analysis totaling 6,970 patients, the mortality rate in patients with infected necrosis and organ failure was about 35.2%, while those with sterile necrosis and organ failure, the mortality rate was at 19.8%, and those with infected necrosis without organ failure, the mortality rate was at 1.4%. These and other studies showed that organ failure is central to the definition of severe acute pancreatitis. If organ failure persists for more than 48 hours, the patient is at high risk of death and a severe category can then be established. Thus, it is important to diagnose or better predict an episode of severe acute pancreatitis and to identify the patients with high risk of developing complications. Early recognition of severe pancreatitis is crucial in its management. Timing is key, and we need to be decisive in admitting these patients in the ICU or monitored care to prevent further deterioration and to avoid deadly complications. You can see on your screen the indications for monitored or intensive care. Patients with severe acute pancreatitis, patients with acute pancreatitis, and one or more of the following parameters pulse less than 40 or more than 159 beats per minute, a systolic arterial pressure of less than 80 millimeter mercury or mean arterial pressure of less than 60 millimeter mercury or diastolic arterial pressure of more than 120 millimeter mercury, a respiratory rate of 35, more than 35 breaths per minute, serum sodium of less than 110 or more than 170 millimoles per liter, serum potassium of less than 2 or more than 7 millimoles per liter, PaO2 of less than 50 millimeter mercury, a pH of less than 7.1 or more than 7.7, serum glucose of more than 800 milligrams per deciliter, serum calcium of more than 15 milligrams per deciliter, and if the patient presents with anuria or is comatose. Also, it is important to remind everyone that a period of illness with marked inflammatory response, or SEERS, precede organ failure. And if SEERS is present, identified as pulse more than 90 per minute, rectal temperature of less than 36 or more than 38 degrees Celsius, a WBC count of less than 4,000 or more than 12,000 per cubic millimeter, or a respiratory rate of more than 20, or an arterial PCO2 of less than 32 millimeter mercury, together with elevated hematocrit of more than 44%, BUN of more than 20 milligrams per deciliter, creatinine of more than 1.8 milligrams per deciliter, age more than 60, and underlying cardiac or pulmonary disease and obesity are the indications as mentioned by the UK guidelines for the management of acute pancreatitis. 
the etiology of acute pancreatitis should be determined because we want to project the need for definitive treatment. For example, if the cause of the acute pancreatitis of our patient is that of gallstone disease, then we need to decide on the timing of our cholecystectomy. If the cause of the acute pancreatitis is alcohol intake or hypertriglyceridemia, then we need to have a plan to avoid its recurrence. Now, almost all acute pancreatitis guidelines recommend that ultrasound be performed upon admission. When doubt exists, computed tomography provides good evidence of the presence or absence of pancreatitis. We need to assess all patients with severe acute pancreatitis with contrast enhanced CT scan or MRI within 72 to 96 hours upon symptom onset and 7 to 10 days after the initial scan. Contrast enhanced CT scan is the imaging modality of choice for diagnosis, staging, and detection of complications of acute pancreatitis. MRI would be preferable to contrast enhanced CT scan among patients with allergy to iodinated contrast, those patients with renal impairment or insufficiency, in young or pregnant patients to minimize radiation exposure. When the ultrasound does not show gallstones, sludge, or biliary obstruction, and in the absence of cholangitis and or abnormal liver function tests suggesting biliary obstruction, MRCP or endoscopic ultrasound rather than diagnostic and endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography should be used to screen for occult cholecholithiasis if no other etiology can be established. This is the Balthazar CT severity index that graded pancreatitis based on the degree of inflammation, presence of fluid collections, and the extent of necrosis. Obviously, a higher score is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. In the 2019 World Society of Emergency Surgery Group Guideline, they asked the question, which laboratory parameters should be considered in the diagnostic process? So during acute inflammation, pancreatic digestive enzymes leak to the systemic circulation and is thus used to diagnose acute pancreatitis. The cutoff value, as mentioned earlier, is normally defined to be three times the upper limit of normal. Serum lipase is considered a more reliable diagnostic marker of acute pancreatitis than serum amylase because of its higher sensitivity and a larger diagnostic window. There are numerous biomarkers that have been studied as potential early predictors of the severity of acute pancreatitis. However, at this moment, no laboratory test is practically available or consistently accurate to predict the severity in patients with acute pancreatitis. However, the following laboratory parameters can give us an idea. C-reactive protein of more than 150 milligrams on day three can be used as a prognostic factor for severe acute pancreatitis. Hematocrit more than 44% represents an independent risk factor for pancreatic necrosis. A BUN more than 20 milligrams per deciliter represents itself as an independent predictor of mortality. Procalcitonin is the most sensitive laboratory test for detection of pancreatic infection. 3.8 nanogram per ml or higher within 96 hours after onset of symptoms indicates pancreatic necrosis with a sensitivity and specificity of 93% and 79%. A serum triglyceride level of more than 1,000 milligrams per deciliter indicated it as a possible etiology of the acute pancreatitis. Serum calcium level is related to decrease in serum albumin and is a marker of severity. Serum LDH predicts severe acute pancreatitis, death, and ICU admission, but it should be considered suboptimal as a single marker. So there are no gold standard in prognosticating or predicting severe acute pancreatitis. Probably the best bedside index that we have at the moment is the BICEP score. It is one of the most accurate and applicable in everyday clinical practice because it is simple and it is capable of predicting severity, death, and organ failure as much as the Apache 2 scoring, which has stood the test of time and is, however noted, very cumbersome and complex. 
BICEP represents an acronym of the parameters evaluated in the score. That would be blood urea nitrogen level of more than 8.9 millimoles per liter, impaired mental status, presence of systemic inflammatory response syndrome, age more than 60, and pleural effusion on radiography. A score of 0 to 2 indicates low mortality with less than 2%. And a score of three to five is associated with a higher mortality of more than 15%, which can go as high as about 27%. So one of the key points in managing patients with severe acute pancreatitis is prompt fluid resuscitation. It has been noted that the decrease in the mortality observed over the last decade is due to the prevention of pancreatic necrosis by maintenance of microcirculation due to more extensive fluid resuscitation. Indeed, early fluid resuscitation is indicated to optimize tissue perfusion targets without waiting for hemodynamic worsening. Hydration at a rate of 5 to 10 ml per kilogram per hour with NSS or LRS is suggested. In severely volume depleted patients, we may start with 20 ml per kilogram over 30 minutes, followed by 3 ml per kilogram per hour for the next 8 to 12 hours. Hydroxyethyl starch containing fluid should be avoided given the absence of any demonstrable mortality benefit and a possible risk of multiple organ failure. In a study that compared LRS versus NSS, those who received LRS had significantly lower mean CRP levels, 52 versus 104 milligrams per deciliter, compared with patients who received NSS. And there was likewise a significant reduction in SEERS among patients who received LRS versus those who received NSS after 24 hours. But the evidence for the superiority of Ringer's lactate versus normal saline based on randomized trials is weak. What is important to remember is to limit fluid resuscitation mainly to the first 24 to 48 hours after the onset of disease, and continued aggressive fluid resuscitation is associated with an increased need for intubation and the risk of abdominal compartment syndrome. Abdominal compartment syndrome is defined as a sustained intra-abdominal pressure greater than 20 millimeter mercury that is associated with the development of organ dysfunction or failure. It is typically determined by a, by a catheter that is inserted in the urinary bladder. Those patients with severe acute pancreatitis rarely develop acute. There is a question as to whether LRS would be better compared to NSS in the use of resuscitating patients with severe acute pancreatitis. In a study that compared LRS versus NSS, those who received LRS had significantly lower mean CRP levels, 52 versus 104 milligrams per deciliter, compared with patients who received NSS. And there is a, likewise a significant reduction in SEERS among those patients who received LRS versus NSS after 24 hours. But the evidence for the superiority of Ringer's lactate versus normal saline based on randomized trials is weak. What is important to remember is to limit fluid resuscitation mainly to the first 24 to 48 hours after the onset of disease. We should remember that continued aggressive fluid resuscitation is associated with an increased need for intubation and the risk of abdominal compartment syndrome. Abdominal compartment syndrome is defined as sustained intra-abdominal pressure greater than 20 millimeter mercury that is associated with the development of organ dysfunction. This is typically determined by a catheter that is placed in the urinary bladder. This is rarely seen in severe acute pancreatitis. However, when it does happen, it carries with it a very high morbidity and mortality because ACS injures not only the pancreas itself, but also the surrounding organs especially interfering with venous return to the heart and perfusion pressure into the abdomen. Therefore, fluid resuscitation should be goal-directed, and our aim should be to improve vital signs, improve urine output, reduction in hematocrit, and BUN. Control of pain is of paramount importance and should be addressed right away. 
because it can contribute to hemodynamic instability and it affects the quality of life of our patients. Opioids are safe and effective. The first um, example of which is fentanyl with a suggested dose of bolus of 20 to 50 microgram with a 10-minute lockout period. The only thing that we need to watch out for with fentanyl is respiratory depression. Meperidine has been favored over morphine because it doesn't cause an increase in sphincter of OD pressure. However, there are no clinical studies that suggest that morphine can aggravate or cause pancreatitis or cholecystitis. Also, meperidine has a shorter half-life and repeated dose may cause neuromuscular side effects and rarely seizures. Dilaudid is a hydromorphone, an oral opioid, which is used for patients who are non-intubated. Epidural analgesia may be considered for those patients who require high doses of opioids for an extended period of time. Despite some evidence from RCTs, there remains uncertainty about the preferred analgesic and the best method of administration. That is why the best current recommendation now is to adhere to the most current acute pain management guidelines in the perioperative setting. Monitoring of the following should likewise be done. Oxygen saturation should be maintained at greater than 95%. Urine output should be more than 0.5 to 1 cc per kilogram per hour. Hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia should be corrected. Serum glucose levels should be monitored hourly and levels greater than 180 to 200 milligrams should be treated because elevated glucose levels can also increase the risk of secondary pancreatic infections. We should likewise monitor potential abdominal compartment syndrome with serial measurements of urinary bladder pressure. With regards to nutrition in severe acute pancreatitis, I understand that the next topic will be precisely on this subject so I will let the next speaker tackle this more thoroughly. Suffice it to say that oral feeding in the absence of ill use, nausea or vomiting can be initiated early. Up to 20% of patients with acute pancreatitis develop an extra pancreatic infection and it is associated with increased mortality. Antibiotics started once infection is suspended is, sus is suspected but it should be discontinued if cultures are negative and no source of infection is identified. Although early trials suggested that administration of antibiotics might prevent infectious complications in sterile necrosis, subsequent better designed trials have consistently failed to confirm an advantage. Recent evidences have shown that prophylactic antibiotics in patients with acute pancreatitis are not associated with a significant decrease in morbidity or mortality. Thus, routine prophylactic antibiotics for all patients with acute pancreatitis, regardless of the type of pancreatitis or disease severity, are no longer recommended. However, antibiotics would be appropriate in pancreatic sepsis, sepsis for example, those with infected necrosis and abscess, and for those with non-pancreatic sepsis, namely pneumonia, urosepsis, or line sepsis, because these are major sources of morbidity and mortality in patients with severe acute pancreatitis. However, the challenge here is recognizing if the clinical picture is really from an infectious complication or from the inflammatory status caused by the acute pancreatitis. Serum measurements of procalcitonin may be valuable in predicting the risk of developing infected pancreatic necrosis. The diagnostic tool of choice remains the city-guided FNA of pancreatic necrotic areas. A city-guided FNA for gram stain and culture can guide us clinicians in choosing the appropriate antibiotic. However, because of the high rate of false negative findings, some centers have abandoned the routine use of FNA. So which antibiotics would be um, appropriate to use in these settings? Quinolones and carbapenems both show good tissue penetration into the pancreas with the additional benefit of excellent anaerobic coverage. 
However, because of the high resistance to quinolones worldwide, um, we are only recommending its use among patients with allergy to beta-lactam agents. Carbapenems, on the other hand, due to the spread of carbapenem-resistant Klebsiella pneumonia, is also um, used only in very critical, very critically ill patients. Metronidazole, with its bactericidal spectrum focus almost exclusively against anaerobes, also show good penetration into the pancreas. What about secondary bacterial infection? It is said that secondary bacterial infection um, could be because of pathogens that reach the pancreas through the hematogenous pathway via the biliary system ascending from the duodenum via the main pancreatic duct or through transmural colonic migration via translocation of the colonic bacteria. Hence, most pathogens in pancreatic infection are gastrointestinal gram-negative bacteria, although we also see gram-positive bacteria and fungi. Fungal infection is a serious complication of acute pancreatitis, and there is um, an associated increase in morbidity and mortality. Candida albicans is usually the organism that is encountered. However, there is not enough data to support the prevention of fungal infections, and therefore, it is not recommended. Complications of severe acute pancreatitis regarding the cardiovascular system would include heart failure, MI, cardiac dysrhythmia, and cardiogenic shock. And these are addressed with the use of um, crystalloids, uh, antiarrhythmic agents, and intravenous vasopressors. What about uh, respiratory care for patients with severe acute pancreatitis? Oxygen delivered um, through the nasal cannula is routinely used in all patients with acute pancreatitis, and we would like to maintain an oxygen saturation above 90%. Mechanical ventilator, however, must be instituted when tachypnea and dyspnea remain uncorrected or when bronchial secretion clearance start to be in, become ineffective or if the patient is tiring or is predicted to tire. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation can be used as well. ARDS is associated with severe dyspnea, progressive hypoxemia, and increased mortality. And this is due to increased alveolar capillary permeability causing interstitial edema. This is usually noted between day two to day seven of illness, and the treatment is endotracheal intubation with deep ventilation and a low tidal volume to protect the lungs from volume trauma. Renal replacement therapy likewise helps. Seryptis et al. looked at the development of or looked at the risk factors of acute renal impairment in patients with severe acute pancreatitis. And they noted that the development of acute renal impairment in severe acute pancreatitis was associated with hemodynamic instability, whereas excessive volume expansion does not appear to prevent acute renal impairment. So I guess this emphasizes the importance of early fluid resuscitation that should be goal-directed with the aim of maintaining normal vitals normal urine output, and it highlights the ineffectual aggressive fluid resuscitation in preventing acute renal impairment. How about the use of pentoxifilin? In a small clinical trial of 28 patients with severe acute pancreatitis, they were randomized to receive pentoxifilin, 400 milligrams three times a day, or placebo within 72 hours of the diagnosis. Pentoxifilin is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor that lowers tumor necrosis factor and leukotrienes, therefore dampening inflammation. It also improves red blood cell deformability, it diminishes blood viscosity, and it decreases platelet aggregation and the formation of thrombus. It was seen that patients on the pentoxifilin group had fewer ICU admissions and hospital stays versus placebo. However, there was no significant differences in inflammatory markers between the two groups. Therefore, it joins the antifungals and the protease inhibitors as those medications that are currently not recommended. 
very quickly for ERCP in acute pancreatitis, routine ERCP with acute gallstone pancreatitis is not indicated unless there is cholangitis. As for the timing of the cholecystectomy, laparoscopic cholecystectomy during the index admission is recommended in mild acute gallstone pancreatitis. When ERCP and sphincterotomy are performed during the index admission, the risk for recurrent pancreatitis is reduced. But same admission cholecystectomy is still advised owing to an increased risk for other biliary complications. In acute gallstone pancreatitis with peripancreatic fluid collections, the cholecystectomy should be deferred until fluid collections resolve or stabilize and acute inflammation ceases. What happens after acute pancreatitis? Patients with acute pancreatitis are at an increased risk of developing prediabetes and diabetes after their first episode of acute pancreatitis, according to the study of DAS et al. In 2014, a meta-analysis of 24 prospective studies that included 1,102 patients with first episode of acute pancreatitis, 15% were diagnosed with new-onset diabetes mellitus within 12 months, and the risk of diabetes significantly increased five years after the first episode of acute pancreatitis. 40% of individuals with newly diagnosed prediabetes or diabetes mellitus after acute pancreatitis develop pancreatic endocrine insufficiency. A recent meta-analysis revealed that 10% of patients with acute pancreatitis and 36% of those with recurrent acute pancreatitis develop subsequent chronic pancreatitis. In this study by Jan Feng Tu et al., entitled Endocrine and Exocrine Pancreatic Insufficiency After Acute Pancreatitis, a Long-Term Follow-Up Study. It included 113 patients, and 30.1% of these patients developed diabetes mellitus. 29.2% developed impaired glucose tolerance. 29.2% developed mild to moderate exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, and 6.2% were diagnosed with severe exocrine pancreatic insufficiency with fecal elastase 1 values of less than 100 microgram per gram. The integrated morbidity of diabetes mellitus and impaired glucose tolerance after acute pancreatitis was 59.25%, which was higher than exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. 6.2 and 29.2% of patients developed severe and mild to mod moderate exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, respectively. The extent of pancreatic necrosis, more than 50%, walled off necrosis, and insulin resistance, as measured by the HOMA, were the independent risk factors of new onset diabetes after acute pancreatitis. So, in summary, Severe acute pancreatitis occurs in about 20 to 30 percent and carries with it a high mortality rate of more than 15 percent. Early risk stratification and close monitoring of those at risk at the ICU are key. Hydration should be goal-directed. Pain control is a must. Early feeding via enteral route is the dictum. Antibiotics only for those with established infection. ERCP for those with cholangitis and cholecystectomy if possible on the index admission if mild to moderate and delay if, risk, if severe. In one study that was mentioned earlier, the extent of pancreatic necrosis of more than 50%, walled off necrosis, and insulin resistance were the independent risk factors of new onset diabetes mellitus after acute pancreatitis. Thank you very much for listening. And I will be very happy to take your questions if we still have time. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Kapasin, for very uh, succinctly yet comprehensively discussing your topic on the management of severe acute pancreatitis. And um, happy birthday, Dr. Jetna. It's, it's a day early, but let us greet you a very happy birthday. Uh, just to inform everyone, um, uh, the Q, the question, there have been several questions on Dr. Agapasin's topic, and she has answered all of them in the Q&A box. And it, is, uh, it, it can be accessed 
through the Q&A box. So you just go to the Q&A box and you will see all the questions and Dr. Agapasin's answer to, to all of them. But uh, Dr. Agapasin, if I may, uh, just ask that one question so that it can be um, emphasized during this forum uh, about the level of um, lipase and amylase uh, as being um, routinely used and probably uh, erroneously used as a marker of uh, severity in acute pancreatitis. Can you give your comments again, Dr. Judith Gapasin? Hi, everyone. Um, Ome, thank you very much. Um, indeed, uh, that question is very important. What I would like to emphasize is that the serum lipase uh, just tells us the extent of necrosis that's going on in the pancreas, but it doesn't mean that there's organ failure. Remember that the key element in severe acute pancreatitis is the presence of organ failure more than 48 hours. All right. So again, just to emphasize on that, because uh, because of the extent of Dr. Agapasin's lecture, we have run out of time. So just to emphasize on that one very important uh, point. So again, thank you very much and happy birthday, Dr. Thank Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. All right. So for the uh, last lecture, but definitely not the least, in the first part of our single topic conference, uh, it will be on the nutritional principles in the management of severe acute pancreatitis, something that's very important to us uh, Filipinos and, of course, as clinicians. Uh, our next speaker is... Uh, a graduate of the fellowship training program of the UPPGH. Uh, and she is a therapeutic endoscopist by heart, having completed her training in ERCP and EUS at the University of California Davis Medical Center. Um, she is one, uh, a past president of the Philippine Society of Digestive uh, endoscopy and the undaunted chair of the specialty board of gastroenterology, uh, undaunted by the circumstances of the pandemic. And she's currently an active consultant of the Victor Potenciano Medical Center, the Cardinal Santos Medical Center, and the Medical City. Let us all welcome Dr. Yvonne Mina. Dr. Amina. Today, I am tasked to talk about principles of nutritional management in acute pancreatitis. Um, and the course outline will be as follows. First, we will discuss the pathophysiology of malnutrition in severe acute pancreatitis. Later on, we will proceed with nutrition management. And the questions we want to answer will be, what type of medical nutrition is preferable in patients with severe acute pancreatitis? Do we want enteral nutrition or do we want parenteral nutrition? When is the optimal time to start your nutritional support? And what is the substrate you want to give these patients? Looking at the pathophysiology, you will see actually that inflammation plays a very large factor in the development of malnutrition in patients with severe acute pancreatitis. Dr. D most likely has mentioned that in acute pancreatitis, you will have secretion of your inflammatory cytokines, like your alpha TNF factor, your interleukins one and six. Also, there will be secretion of your stress hormones, like your cortisol and catecholamines. This will all lead to hypercatabolism. This will lead to higher energy consumption and metabolic rate. Now imagine, if this acute pancreatitis is complicated further by sepsis and infection, and you choose to couple this with prolonged fasting, you would be certain that there will be a decrease in your body protein stores, which would translate to poorer immunity, poorer hand grip, poorer respiratory muscle function. Contributing to the malnutrition of these patients, Patients with acute pancreatitis will usually present with poor oral intake and vomiting. The poor oral intake might be secondary to anorexia or abdominal pain. They also might have vomiting secondary to ill use, secondary to gastroparesis or gastric obstruction. For example, they might have a pseudocyst obstructing the GI tract. Okay. 
let us not forget that these patients may present to their own comorbidities. Patients with chronic uh, alcoholism will have attendant vitamin and mineral deficiencies at the outset. Your obese patient will not only be obese, but uh, might also have hypertriglyceridemia, especially if you have triglycerides greater than 1,000 milligrams per DL, then this would be such a high risk. Okay. What is important to remember is in patients with severe acute uh, pancreatitis, you also and should consider always that these are patients with high nutritional risk for malnutrition. Before 2008, the traditional method of managing these patients would be to place them NPO, start IV hydration, then start parenteral nutrition. This was based on the assumption that we should rest the pancreas. We said that food in the GI tract would stimulate your cholecystokinin. This will stimulate pancreatic enzyme secretion. And this will result to more pancreatic autodigestion and worsening of your acute pancreatitis. What we have found, actually, is that injured acinar cells cannot fully respond to physiologic stimuli. And therefore, in the setting of acute pancreatitis, you actually have reduced pancreatic enzyme secretion, more so when you have severe acute pancreatitis. So with this in mind, people thought, oh, that's the case. Why don't we feed our patients? So since 2008, 2008 being the time when people started um, looking at giving enteral nutrition over parenteral nutrition. Many studies, numerous studies, meta-analysis have been published since then, and they more or less agree. Enteral nutrition is way better than parenteral nutrition. In this meta-analysis by Al Omran, perform Cochrane standards on the basis of eight RCT and three, with 384 patients involved, you see that there's a 50% decrease in your mortality in patients giving enteral nutrition, multiple organ failure, surgical intervention, systemic infection are also decreased if you give your patients um, enteral nutrition. Now, when they did the study, this study actually also involved patients who might have moderately severe acute pancreatitis. Now, if you subgroup this to patients who only had severe pancreatitis, mortality is actually further reduced by at least 80%. Now, I want you to look at this. This is a slide most likely has been shown earlier. This is a slide we usually show when we're discussing the Atlanta classification. What you see here is that interstitial pancreatitis, 1% mortality, but when you develop pancreatic necrosis, you get 12% mortality. If this gets infected, mortality rises to about 25%. Our speaker, Dr. Judith Gapasin, told you what the strategy is in preventing the formation of your pancreatic necrosis. He said, do aggressive hydration in the first 24 hours of the onset of disease. Now, what do you think is the strategy to prevent pancreatic necrosis from getting infected? We know that prophylactic antibiotics do not work, but feeding your patient enterally is the key in preventing the patient from developing an infected necrosis. And that's why 2008 study and feeding in patient was thought as a real game changer. Enteral nutrition, not only, of course, you don't have problems in your IV line access, you don't get line sepsis, it's inexpensive. But as I mentioned earlier, the real importance of enteral feeding is it prevents you from having your gut atrophy and bacterial translocation. Enteral feeding has trophic effects on your gut. It keeps your intercellular um, tight junctions tight or secure. It enhances your gut motility. 
gut motility and distension will improve your splanchnic blood flow. So you don't have development of your free radicals. Overall, what this does is you prevent bacterial translocation. You prevent the seeding of your pancreatic necrosis, so becoming it um, infected. This is not to say that parenteral nutrition does not have a role. Okay? Admittedly, all major societies, your ASPEN, your SPEN, your ACG, your pancreas group, all recommend enteral feeding. There are circum circumstances, however, one more, when one may still need to deliver nutrition via the parenteral route. When is this? When and nutrition, enteral nutrition is not tolerated, when enteral nutrition does not fully meet targeted nutritional requirements, when it is contraindicated. For example, in the setting of prolonged paralytic ileus, bowel obstruction, or if you have mesenteric ischemia. We also have to mention, of course, that abdominal compartment syndrome might be a complication of your acute pancreatitis, and especially if you have intra-abdominal pressure greater than 20, you should not be feeding your patient via um, enterally, sorry. Now, remember that even if you were supplementing the diet with uh, parenteral nutrition, you still would like to give trophic doses of your EN. Now, a note with regards intra-abdominal pressure and abdominal compartment syndrome before I change the slide. What are the things to remember? One, if you have a patient with abdominal compartment syndrome, please refer the patient to Dr. Marika Otay Sakua. We know that she lives for these challenging nutritional cases. Abdominal compartment syndrome is defined as intra-abdominal pressure greater than 20 with associated organ failure. Your usual or your normal intra-abdominal pressure should be less than 12 millimeter mercury. Mortality will rise to about 66% when you have severe acute pancreatitis and he develops compartment syndrome. Enteral nutrition may increase intraluminal pressure with subsequent elevation of your intra-abdominal pressure and may develop complications. Now, if your intra-abdominal pressure is less than 15, you may start feeding, trophic feeding, and then increase your feeding as the patient is able to tolerate. If your intra-abdominal pressure is about 15 to 20 millimeter mercury, then again, Insert an esophageal tube and start at 20 cc per hour, trophic feeding. If the intra-abdominal pressure though rises, then what you need to do is to temporarily stop the feeding and then give your feeding or your nutrition via the parenteral route. With the previous slide, we have quoted that we're going to deliver it by NJT. The question is, What's the best access? Well, the best access is actually oral route. The patients will love you if you don't insert any tubes. But more often than not, these patients with severe pancreatitis will have ill use or pain. And these patients will most likely need a tube place. <coughs> Sorry. Traditionally, your nasogeginal tube was preferred on the assumption that there will be less pancreatic stimulation or autodigestion of the pancreas if the food is delivered more distally into the GI tract. Moreover, there was the uh, potential problem of aspiration pneumonia if feeding was by the NG route. NGT, however, was expensive. You needed to call either an endoscopist or a radiologist to insert it. Okay. So people were looking, okay, can we use gastric feeding instead of really pushing for jejunal feeding? So Yu Leng did a meta-analysis involving four RCTs involving 237 patients. And what did he find out? NGT was not inferior to your NJT feeding. There were no significant differences in incidences of mortality 
exacerbation of pain, risk of aspiration, you still meet the energy requirement balance for both gastric and digestional feeding. So actually, from a pragmatic point of view, it's probably easier to insert an NGT, and that is why the nasogastric feeding is preferred. So these are the SPEN 2020 guidelines when it comes to access gastric versus jejunal feeding. If enteral nutrition is required in patients, NGT is preferred. In cases where patients have digestive intolerance, NGT is preferred. In patients undergoing minimally invasive necrosectomy who are unable to feed orally, the nasojejunal route is preferred. For patients who require nasoenteral feeding for a prolonged period of time, kawawa naman yung patient, acute pancreatitis for more than 30 days, then these patients, you should actually consider placing a gastrostomy or a, nasoje or, sorry, or a jejunostomy tube. In terms of timing of the enteral feeding, okay, this would probably be the better study. You look at meta-analysis prior to this study, and they were sort of conflicting. Okay. Now, this is a cohort study. Data of 104 patients were prospectively collected, and they looked at the primary outcome, infected secondary infection, both pancreatic and extrapancreatic, and they looked at secondary outcomes, like looking into your albumin, if there's presence of acute GI injury, like bleeding, and EN-related complications. Based on the ROC curve analysis, the third day okay, after hospital admission was considered the best cut of time for introducing your enteral nutrition. The area under the curve is about 0.744. After propensity score matching proportion of secondary infection in the early EN group was significantly lower than late EN. Now, if you do also a regression analysis, it shows that early enteral feeding was a protective factor against secondary infection. But the real importance of this study is, of course, they say that you should really start feeding these patients after uh, within the third day. What do you give? These are the uh, guidelines per SPEN in 2009 which hasn't changed since then. In terms of energy, you provide 25 to 30 kilocal per kilogram body weight. You probably will be starting these patients on 25 kilocal per day. And you give a protein of about 1.2 to 2 gram per kilogram per day. Carbohydrates, you want to aim for 10 millimoles per day. Remember that in patients with acute pancreatitis, they might be prone to hyperglycemia, either because they have insulin um, hype, I mean, they have decreased uh, insulin requirements, not to mention intolerance. Lipids, this is especially important when you have patients with hypertriglyceridemia. You want to maintain the blood triglyceride levels less than 12 millimole per day. So careful about giving your lipid emulsions. The question would be, do you give elemental or polymeric, okay? Elemental and semi-elemental formula are thought to induce less pancreatic stimulation. Now, Petrov in 2009 did a systematic review and a meta-analysis of enteral nutrition formulas in acute pancreatitis, and this involved 20 RCTs and an aggregate 1,000 more or less patients involved, okay? And what he found out was there's no significant difference in feeding intolerance, infection, and deaths if you give polymeric compared to your uh, semi-elemental formulation. Now, considering that your semi-elemental diet is more expensive than your polymeric formula, it is therefore more practical to give your polymeric formula. What else can you give your patients? How about glutamine? Glutamine being something you sometimes give to your, well, to your ICU patients. It has an antioxidant effect. It improves immune function and intestinal integrity of your gut.
It prevents mucosal atrophy and improves intestinal barrier function. It is, however, considered a conditional essential amino acid. Uh, it does decrease when you have severe acute pancreatitis. So is there benefit in giving glutamine to our patients? Azrani, in 2013, did a meta-analysis involving 12 RCTs, 505 patients, and he showed that glutamine supplementation resulted significantly in reducing the risk of mortality and total infectious complications. The thing to note is that if you did a subgroup analysis, only patients receiving parenteral nutrition but not enteral nutrition showed statistically significant benefit. This study, the results, were echoed in a similar study by uh, Yong Li. He also did a meta-analysis of 10 RCT involving this time 215 patients. Glutamine-enriched nutrition is helpful in elevating the albumin levels, decreasing your C-reactive protein, decreasing your infectious complication rate, and mortality. Again, what is noted is that IV infusion manifested more advantages by decreasing the incidence of mortality and infection. So right now, what are the recommendations? IV glutamine may um, seems to be uh, beneficial, especially if we give it patients on TPN. Enteral glutamine still need further study. So I will end this talk and give you the summary. Nutrition therapy not only prevents malnutrition, but is key to reducing systemic inflammation and death. In severe acute pancreatitis, enteral nutrition should be given to maintain gut function and achieve positive clinical outcomes. Gastric and jejunal feeding are equally effective. Polymeric formula is safe and inexpensive compared to your elemental formula and consider giving IV glutamine in patients with total parenteral, being given total parenteral nutrition. So with this, I end my talk. Good day. Thank you very much, Dr. Yvonne Mina, for delivering that very important uh, lecture on nutrition in severe acute pancreatitis. Um, doctor, can you uh, very briefly just um, give us again um, and a, a short answer on probably the most uh, frequently asked question in acute pancreatitis, when can we start feeding? When we were, uh, uh, before we used to be taught that uh, as long as the patient uh, is in pain or to, to wait for as long as we could before we start feeding. But now, as you have pointed out, it, the, the paradigm, it, there has been a paradigm shift. So can you give us very like uh, pearls probably in uh, clinical practice? When can we start uh, considering, probably even if not in severe acute pancreatitis, but in acute pancreatitis patients in general? In most patients, most patients would probably have mild or moderately severe pancreatitis. And what the recommendations right now especially if you look at ACG is you can actually start feeding the patient you know, when, you're, when the patient comes in. But what I usually do in practice, however, is hydrate the patient. Okay? And more or less within the following day, even if the patient had abdominal pain or some nausea, I would start already feeding this patient. Okay? Now, uh, admittedly for patients with severe pancreatitis, these patients are most likely the patients with ill use, with nausea, with vomiting, okay? So again, you would still hydrate these patients and then resuscitate these patients, okay? In that meta-analysis where they were looking at the timing of when to start feeding, okay, yeah. you would look at that, the, the reason why they went in and did that study was that study in Netherlands showed, for example, if you can wait, okay? Uh, what if I just wait for these patients at least three days before I start feeding this patient? We can actually do that. Okay. So uh, it depends on the patient in part, but what I usually do for mild to moderate, probably the following day, I would start or try feeding this patient. 
if it has pain, then you have to assess is this worsening of the pancreatitis because of ill use or what? Or there might be other conditions um, which a patient might have which might be contributing to her uh, nausea and vomiting. Okay. Uh, Dr. Amina, I, I remember reading some s something somewhere before mm -hmm. in one of uh, our textbooks before in mm -hmm. med school that, well, this is actually regarding appendicitis. They're saying that a hungry patient does not have uh, appendicitis. Can we use that same like uh, general statement when we are talking about acute pancreatitis? Well, it's hard to... Well, what we know is, okay, when the pancreatitis is resolving, then the patient might be telling you, actually, can be, I be off? Can I be fed already? Okay, that's the usual thing that we see when we have patients in the clinic. Um, I don't know. With regards appendicitis and, uh, and the feeding, because, you know, of course, with appendicitis right now, uh, or even not going, there's some trend that you might not need to do surgery even. Mm -hmm. All right. Doctor, yeah. I think we, uh, we have uh, time for only just one more question. It's from Dr. Ang. Mm -hmm. uh, is probiotic, the use of probiotics, beneficial for these patients with severe acute pancreatitis? Actually, there's a meta-analysis that was done on probiotics, and the, uh, it's inconclusive, okay? The thing is, uh, admittedly, there was one trial, for example, the appropriate, I uh, can't remember the trial, where in the patient was given probiotics, severe acute pancreatitis, and there was a negative, actually, result. But except for that one trial, the other trials are positive. Having said that, in the trial, the patients had really bad, I mean, hemodynamics, okay? And as we know, we shouldn't be feeding patients, actually, who are hypotensive. So that was the that was the problem with that trial. Now going back to the trials on uh, on probiotics, it's still inconclusive. The reason the meta analysis came out with it's not conclusive is, for one thing, uh, it was such a heterogeneous population. They did not decide, for example, on in terms of what particular probiotic to get, the duration and the dose. So. At present, we cannot give any recommendations when it comes to probiotics. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Yvonne Mina. Unfortunately, we are over time actually for the first uh, part. So it really is, I'm sure you will all agree with me that it has been a truly stimulating first part of our single topic conference. And judging by the questions and the level of audience participation, I dare say that this forum has achieved the objectives that it has uh, uh, set to meet, right? So I share the sentiments of the, the chair of the Council of Pancreatic Obiliary uh, Diseases, Dr. Frederick D., that to have generated this much interest on such a specialized topic on GI is truly inspiring. And I think we uh, we all have our very eloquent speakers to thank for that. So with this, I close this first part of the STC, and I welcome to the virtual stage uh, Dr. Ivan Ong, the sec uh, moderator for the second part. Again, thank you very much, everyone, for your attention and your participation. Thank you to our moderator, Dr. Romel Romano, and to all our speakers. We will now begin with the second half of the conference. To introduce the speakers and to facilitate the Q&A sessions is our moderator. He obtained his medical degree in the University of Santo Tomas. He is a fellow at the Philippine College of Physicians, Philippine Society of Gastroenterology, and Philippine Society of Digestive Endoscopy. He had his fellowship training in gastroenterology at the University of Santo Tomas University Hospital and fellowship training in therapeutic endoscopy at Barmbeck General Hospital in Hamburg. He is past president of the Philippine Society of Digestive Endoscopy. Currently, he is the director in therapeutic endoscopy training program in the Metropolitan Medical Center. Let us all welcome our second moderator, Dr. Ivan Ong. Good afternoon. 
I will now be taking over Dr. Romano for this segment of our single topic conference for today. We will now be talking about the common complications or rather the more severe complications of acute pancreatitis. And we have lined up some very good speakers for this afternoon. Our first speaker to talk on the diagnosis and management of pancreatic fistula is Dr. Luther Morales. He is a graduate of the University of the Philippines in Manila. He also obtained his residency in internal medicine and fellowship training in the same institution. He had his fellowship training in endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography at the National University Hospital of Singapore. He is currently the PRO of the Philippine Society of Digestive Endoscopy. So may we now have Dr. Moralit. So good afternoon again, everyone. First and foremost, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk. And thank you, Dr. Ivan Ong, for that wonderful introduction. My topic this afternoon is entitled Diagnosis and Management of Pancreatic Fistula. I have the following objectives this afternoon, and these are my disclosures. So, okay. Um, let us first define pancreatic fistula. Pancreatic fistula is defined as an abnormal communication between the pancreas and adjacent structures or distant organs or spaces. This then causes leakage of pancreatic secretions, which can cause significant morbidity due to malnutrition, skin excoriation, and infection. Pancreatic fistula can be classified in a number of ways. First, whether it is an internal or an external fistula. So an external fistula has an abnormal connection with the skin. It can be subdivided into high output, those with more than 200 ml of output per day, or low output external fistula. Internal fistula, on the other hand, drains inside the body, for example, presenting as pancreatic ascites, pleural effusion, or communicating with other viscera or retroperitoneum or the, even the mediastinum. So pancreatic fistulas can also be classified based on the underlying disease process, like acute or even chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic cancer, and even in rare cases, coming from normal pancreas. And lastly, it can also be classified depending on the immediate predisposing cause, such as post-operative or from pancreatic fistulas from percutaneous drainage of pancreatic fluid collections, or in some cases, because of trauma. So again, non-iatrogenic causes of pancreatic fistulas are either the acute or from a chronic pancreatitis. Iatrogenic causes of pancreatic fistulas include pancreatic resection or percutaneous drainage of pancreatic pseudocyst, pancreatic abscess, or organized necrosis. Internal pancreatic fistulas most commonly occur due to chronic alcohol-induced pancreatitis whereas external fistulas are usually iatrogenic. So both these internal and external fistulas result from a partial disruption of the pancreatic duct. Disruption of the pancreatic duct leads to leakage of pancreatic juice, which forms an acute fluid collection. If the fluid collections and the leak persist, a fibroinflammatory rind is formed around the collection, also called the pseudocyst. So persistent leakage of pancreatic juice can lead to the development of an internal fistula due to spontaneous erosion into the neighboring hollow viscous or communication with peritoneal or pleural cavities 
or development of fluid collections in the mangiosinum, lesser sac, retroperitoneum, or perihepatic space, thrombosis of the splenic or portal vein, and bleeding from arterial pseudoaneurysms. If the communication occurs anteriorly into the peritoneal cavity, it results in pancreatic, uh, pancreatic ascites. A posterior communication, on the other hand, may track into the pleural cavity or mediastinum. So this figure shows the patient may develop as labeled in num number two, a pancreatico enteric or pancreatico biliary fistula. Anteriorly, as in number four, patient may be, have pancreatic ascites or even posteriorly as in number five to develop pancreatic pleural effusion. And even as an externally pancreatic fistula as an iatrogenic complication from an intervention. So when do we suspect a patient to have pancreatic fistula? The diagnosis of pancreatic fistula should be suspected in patients with history of pancreatitis, pancreatic trauma, or surgery. Some patients with internal PFs can be asymptomatic. Abdominal pain, distension, nausea, vomiting, ascites, pleural effusion, or drainage from an abdominal wound. Please take note that these symptoms tend to be nonspecific and a high index of suspicion is necessary. The diagnosis is established by finding high levels of extravasated amylase and evidence of duct disruption on imaging of the pancreatic duct. The approach and diagnosis of patients suspected of PF require imaging. In patients with PF, an abdominal CT scan may demonstrate free and walled off fluid collections in the abdominal and thoracic cavities and changes of acute or chronic pancreatitis. However, a CT scan is diagnosis of PF only if performed immediately after an ERCP when it may demonstrate a fistulous tract. So this is a CT scan image of a 66-year-old male with a gastropancreatic fistula, a huge one in that. So the following blood test, a complete blood count, electrolytes, ALT, AST, bilirubins, calcium, amylase, lipase, and albumin should be obtained to rule out other causes of abdominal pain. If patient has an external fistula, the effluent should be collected for fluid analysis. Although there is no established cutoff, pancreatic fluid amylase level than, uh, levels greater than three times the serum amylase is supportive of a diagnosis of prior pancreatic fistula. In patients with ascites, diagnostic paracentesis should be performed. We assess acetic fluid cell count and differential count. RAM stain and culture, amylase, albumin, total protein, and cytology. So the combination of SAG below 1.1 grams per deciliter, a protein level of more than 3 grams per liter, and acetic amylase greater than serum amylase is suggestive of pancreatic ascites. Often, fluid amylase levels of 4,000 units per liter or higher is seen. In some cases, the white cell count may be elevated due to concomitant infection of the acetic fluid. Torus synthesis should be performed in patients with pleural effusion. Effusions associated with pancreatic or pleural fistulas are exudative and amylase rich with pleural fluid amylase greater than the upper limits of normal for the serum amylase or a pleural fluid to serum amylase ratio greater than one. Pleural fluid effusions due to a pancreatic or pleural fistula can be distinguished from a sympathetic pleural effusion that occurs following an acute pancreatitis by a therapeutic thoracentesis. Pancreatic or pleural effluents have high amylase content and tend to reaccumulate re after therapeutic thoracentesis, whereas a sympathetic pleural effusion do not have an elevated amylase and do not reaccumulate following thoracentesis. Please take note of that. We now proceed with the assessment of the pancreatic duct. 
ERCP provides direct evidence of a pancreatic fistula and it is the test of choice if therapeutic pancreatic fest, uh, stenting is planned. So findings on ERCP suggestive of a duct disruption include extravasation of contrast during injection of the pancreatic duct, the presence of fluid collections that communicate directly to the main pancreatic duct, pancreatic ascites, or the presence of a pancreatic fistula support the diagnosis. ERCP has the ability to demonstrate contrast filling the pancreatic ducts and the extravasation in real time. ERCP also has a higher sensitivity and specificity for pancreatic duct leak as compared with CT scan. However, ERCP has the disadvantage of requiring sedation and is associated with risk of pancreatitis. MRCP has the advantage that it is non-invasive and it can guide clinical management by delineating pancreatic duct injuries, including those upstream of a complete duct disruption that would not be visualized on ERCP. We therefore perform a secretin-enhanced MRCP to stimulate pancreatic secretion and thereby visualize the side branches. However, this test is not available in the Philippines and is not therapeutic unlike ERCP and it does not demonstrate exacerbation of contrast material in real time. In general, we reserve the use of fistulography to determine the actual site of internal communication of an external pancreatic fistula only if it is not evident on ERCP or uh, secretin-induced MRCP. However, the, for PFs occurring after pancreatic resection, fistulography is preferred over MRCP or ERCP in patients with operative or percutaneously placed pancreatic drainage catheters. In such cases, a fistulogram can also delineate associated fluid collections and guide the repositioning of catheters to optimize drainage. However, fistulography is associated with the risk of infection of undrained collections. This is an image from up to date showing a fistulogram through a percutaneous drain catheter demonstrating a per pancreatic cutaneous fistula as pointed by the arrow, connecting to the disruption of the pancreatic duct at the area of the neck. There is retrograde and antigrade filling of the pancreatic duct through the fistula. The management of pancreatic fistulas depend on the symptoms which are abdominal pain, fever, chills, jaundice, or early satiety. Also, the characteristics and location of the fluid collection on imaging, for example, the presence of pancreatic necrosis, proximity of the pancreatic fistula to the bowel lumen, and the presence of associated complications like infection of the pancreatic fluid. In the absence of significant symptoms or coexisting infected pancreatic necrosis, Initial management of PFs consists of supportive care. Supportive care includes the following measures, maintaining patients on NPO to reduce pancreatic stimulation, insertion of a nasogeal feeding tube to bypass the pancreas and correct malnutrition. Enteral nutrition is associated with a lower incidence of infection, higher 30-day fistula closure, and shorter time to closure of post-operative pancreatic fistula as compared to TPN. We also correct fluid and electrolyte disturbances. And we provide skin care for the excoriation due to external pancreatic fistulas. So matostatin analogs such as octreotide can be used in patients with high output external pancreatic fistulas or those that result in electrolyte abnormalities or skin breakdown. So matostatin preparations may be effective in the reduction of fistula, but not, uh, sorry, the reduction of fistula output, but not the rate of fistula closure. In a 2012 meta-analysis of seven randomized trials, they included 297 patients, closure rates were not significantly higher in patients treated with somatostatin analogs as compared with controls. With supportive care, case series have reported fistula closure in approximately 80% of patients uh, with external and 50 to 65% of internal fistulas over four to six weeks. 
We then obtained follow-up abdominal imaging with an abdominal CT scan or MRI in six to eight weeks to evaluate the size of the peripancreatic fluid collections. Imaging should be repeated sooner if the patient develops abdominal pain, fever, chills, jaundice, or early satiety. In patients with clinical symptoms, sepsis physiology, or increasing WBC cell count, pancreatic fluid should be sent for gram stain and culture to rule out an infection. And systemic antibiotics should be administered in patients with evidence of pancreatic fluid collections. For patients who are symptomatic or those with persistent or enlarging fluid collections on follow-up imaging six to eight weeks after supportive care, additional intervention is required. Management options include endoscopic therapy, percutaneous drainage, or surgery. Endoscopic therapy is the preferred approach for management of most PFs. The goal of endoscopic therapy is to permit, promote internal drainage of pancreatic secretions, thereby reducing the flow to the fistulous tract. This is typically accomplished by placement of a pancreatic stent and or pancreatic sphincterotomy. Transpapillary stent placement is performed during ERCP. To avoid theoretical risk of transient biliary obstruction due to pancreatic sphincterotomy, we perform a biliary sphincterotomy to stent placement. We then place a stent, preferably bridging the ductal disruption. In a case series by Alexakis et al., endoscopic therapy for pancreatic fistula has been associated with the success rate of 85 to 100 percent. This cartoon shows us what ERCP can do if a pancreatic stent is passed through a stricture or a fistula, allowing direct and preferential drainage of pancreatic secretions into the duodenum. This is an actual ERCP showing a pancreatogram of a patient with high amylase ascites demonstrating a ductal disruption in the mid-body as shown by the arrow in the left upper image. The leak can be appreciated below the arrow. In letter B, there is a guide wire placed across the disruption. And in C, a pancreatic stent is placed. So this is the stent as highlighted in yellow. Complications of pancreatic duct stenting include acute pancreatitis, pain, and much less commonly, perforation and cholangitis. Late complications include pancreatic ductal and parenchymal changes that resemble chronic pancreatitis and stent malfunction, which is principally due to occlusion. Endoscopic transgastric or transduodenal drainage is performed in patients who have large symptomatic walled up pancreatic fluid collection that is compressing the stomach or duodenum. When there is close up position of the fluid collection to the bowel lumen, usually this is done through endoscopic ultrasound. For VFs occurring after elected pancreatic resection, Prophylactic percutaneous drains placed at operation may control the existing PFs with possible need for repositioning or exchange. For all other PFs, percutaneous drainage should be considered only when endoscopic and surgical drainage are not feasible or have failed, as percutaneous drainage of an internal PF may lead to development of an external PF in 5 to 10% of cases. Surgery for a persistent PF is indicated when endoscopic management fails or is technically unfeasible. The operative approach depends on the location of the disruption, status of the pancreatic remnant upstream from the ductal disruption, presence of necrosis, vascular thrombosis, and prior interventions. In patients with chronic pancreatic fistulas, surgical options include enteric, uh, enteral, enteric drainage of an associated pseudocyst, pancreatic ductal decompression with pancreatic jejunostomy, partial pancreatic resection, and fistula jejunostomy. Although there are limited data to guide the timing of surgical intervention, we wait three to six months for the development of a very fibrotic tract. Enteric drainage of chronic external pancreatic fistula is generally effective, although it may be associated with fistula recurrence. So surgical treatment of PFs in patients who have failed all other treatments has a success rate of 
approximately 90% and had an associated mortality rate of 6 to 9%. This is one of the examples of a potential surgical treatment for chronic pancreatic fistula by doing pancreatic jejunostomy. Surgery for a persistent pancreatic fistula is, is indicated when endoscopic management fails or is technically unfeasible. So endoscopic sealants have been used to close pancreatic fistulas in small series, but additional data are needed before they can be routinely recommended. And butyl 2 cyanoacrylate or our histoacryl is delivered as a stable monomer in liquid state, but polymerizes into a solid on, on contact with body fluids at neutral pH. In one series in which 12 patients with peripancreatic or external pancreatic fistulas uh, undergo endoscopic injection with cyanoacrylate into the fistulous tract, the complete fistula closure happened in 8 of 12 patients. But we need additional data because this is a very small study. So in summary, this is my last slide. Pancreatic fistulas may form from acute or chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic neoplasms, and in rare cases, normal pancreas. Presence of history of pancreatitis, pancreatic trauma, or surgery, plus high levels of extra extravasated amylase and abdominal imaging showing pancreatic duct disruption establishes the diagnosis. Uh, management is mainly supportive, and somatostatin analogs may be used to decrease outputs of pancreatic fistulas. Endoscopic therapy is the preferred treatment option of pancreatic fistulas. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moralit, for your lecture. It sounds so simple the way you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have a question from the audience. The question is about, uh, I'm not very sure, but the question is, what's the difference between the CT scan done before and after ERCP for diagnosis of pancreatic fistula? Uh, sir, um, the, according to what I've read, um, the reason why we do CT scan after an ERCP is because the contrast material from the ERCP may be able to guide us where the track of the fistula is. So parang immediately after the ERCP, we do the CT scan in order to guide us where the fistula actually is located. So parang timing po of the CT scan is necessary to identify the source of the fistula or the, the, the site of the fistula. Okay. So what, what about the use of uh, somatostatin for closure of fistulas? Usually these are the external ones. What's your yes, threshold for waiting? before you decide to do something else? Uh, ako, sir, once there is a cutaneous fistula, as much as possible, as long as it's still low output, I already start with somatostatin analog, especially um, uh, given that uh, these pancreatic fistulas are quite tricky to treat, depending on the ongoing domino effect of the ongoing severe uh, acute pancreatitis. So the earlier the intervention is, I think, uh, uh, for me, it's better. However, there's no data supporting whether the timing of uh, somatostatin analogs should be started at specifically what time. So I was not able to encounter the timing. Sir. Okay, we have a question from your boss, from Dr. Banyas. Oh, but I. <laughs> <laughs> this question is, is there a guideline on when to, when to say that endoscopic drainage has failed and we have to do surgery in pancreatic fistula after acute pranc? Uh, sir, so surgery kasi as uh, recommended in that uh, particular uh, study that I've read requires about six to eight weeks, sir, para mag maging fibrotic yung track. So we do not do immediately the surgery because the, the tendency is if the track is not mature, it will close and then fluid reaccumulation will happen after surgery. So that's why they want about six to eight weeks, sir, to make sure that the fibrotic track is already fibrotic. Yeah, it's always the, the time or the duration for the maturity of the track. Be it yes, sir. Law for something else. Okay, yes, we sir. have two more questions, but I would suggest that uh, Dr. Marad will answer them through the Q&A box because we are running out of time. So maybe we can uh, go to the next uh, 
speakers. Thank you very much, Luther. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. God bless po. Hello. Our second speaker is Dr. Mark Anthony De Luzon. He'll be talking on pancreatic sources, when is the best timing and the best method to drain. He is a graduate of UPBGH, where he obtained his residency in internal medicine and fellowship in gastroenterology. He trained in advanced ERCP and EUS at the California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco, USA. He is now an associate professor at the UPBGH College of Medicine. He heads a section for advanced endoscopy in the same institution. He is also the endoscopy unit head of the NKTI, and he is a past president of the Philippine Society of Digestive Endoscopy. Now, we are just welcome, Dr. Anthony De Luzon. I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, this wonderful um, conference and for inviting me today to share you with you my experience and expertise on uh, the management of pancreatic pseudocysts in terms of, of draining uh, these pancreatic pseudocysts. So I have no disclosures, and this is the outline of my talk. Um, I'll enumerate the indications and contraindications of pseudocyst drainage, present to you different modalities for pancreatic pseudocyst drainage, and also show you the advantages and disadvantages of each modality. At the end of my talk, I'll give you a short summary. So let's begin with um, just discussing how pseudocyst um, begins. So they all usually begin from an acute bout of pancreatitis. Um, and then after a week or so, the pseudocyst ensues. A pseudocyst is defined as a fluid collection contained within a well-defined capsule of fibrous or granulation tissue, or sometimes a combination of both. It does not possess an epithelial lining and it can persist beyond four weeks. It may develop in the setting of acute or chronic pancreatitis. The imaging differences of uh, pancreatic pseudocyst versus a walled off necrosis is that a pancreatic pseudocyst is well circumscribed fluid collection that is usually round or oval and they are typically extrapancreatic compared to a Waldorf necrosis, which can be intra or extrapancreatic in location. But the defining uh, imaging characteristics, uh, characteristic of a pancreatic pseudocyst is that it is a homogeneous fluid density with absence of non-liquid components compared to your Waldorf necrosis in which it is heterogeneous with varying degrees of liquid and non-liquid uh, substances in its uh, capsulated uh, lesion. So the cysts are also well-defined uh, in terms of their wall and completely encapsulates the fluid collection. So as you see here in a CT scan of a pseudocyst on your, light, uh, on your left and a Waldorf pancreatic necrosis on your right, this is a typical picture of a pancreatic pseudocyst. So when do you drain them? So indications for drainage of a pancreatic pseudocyst are as follows. If you have abdominal pain, which is not um, medically managed or not treated adequately with um, your pain relievers, your patient is having a uh, failure to thrive or the peripancreatic fluid collection that you have is now infected, causing sepsis in your patient. You can also drain a pancreatic pseudocyst if there's persistent organ failure despite maximum supportive therapy. Or if you have gastric or intestinal outlet shock obstruction or even biliary obstruction. And if the size is already more than six centimeters, because these are the 
sizes that usually don't shrink um, or cause symptoms. Or if your pseudocyst is rapidly enlarging, which can cause obstruction or even pain in your patient. So what are the types of intervention? So there's surgical, percutaneous, and endoscopic. Under endoscopic, there's transmural and transpapillary. For transmural, you can have direct vision or EGD guided versus EUS guided or ultrasound guided. So let's talk about these techniques. So the choice of technique actually depends on your local expertise and the equipment available to you. But generally, collections abutting the stomach and duodenum should be ad addressed with an endoscopic approach. Patients with large collections that extend into the pelvis or paracolic gutters or have multiple collections may require sometimes a combination of these uh, drainage techniques. You can have both endoscopy-guided transmural and percutaneous drainage in, in such cases. So let's begin with surgical drainage. Surgery in pancreatic pseudocyst usually in, entails three uh, methods, either a cyst gastrostomy, a cyst jejunostomy, or a cyst duodenostomy. And usually for pseudocysts that occur in the head of the pancreas, they do a cyst duodenostomy. During the past um, several years, the role of surgery in the management of pancreatic pseudocyst has changed. And the reasons are number one, Endoscopic and percutaneous drainage techniques have become more and more refined and universally available nowadays in most hospitals. The natural history of pseudocysts has disclosed that most asymptomatic pseudocysts need no treatment. And the result of cis-enteric anastomosis have shown that they generally function for a short term only and they can recur. And this has resulted towards a shift in employing minimally invasive techniques such as endoscopic modalities over surgical intervention. For percutaneous drainage, it is defined as a non-operative ultrasound or CT guided placement percutaneously of a catheter to drain a pseudocyst. It is now also largely replaced by the endoscopic approach due to higher morbidity rates, longer hospital stays, and long duration of indwelling drains, as I will discuss later during my talk. It is now usually used as a bridging technique, meaning you can put a percutaneous drain to decompress retroperitoneal fluid collections and allow your patient to stabilize if the patient has sepsis prior to operative debridement if the cyst is immature or there's lack of endoscopic access in which endoscopic access is not present. And then third B, endoscopic drainage. So when do you do endoscopic drainage? Usually, pseudocyst drainage is performed if the cyst is already more than four weeks old and it is predominantly liquefied, meaning more than 90% or more than 80% is already um, liquid. The cyst has a well-formed well fibrous wall, and the cyst is accessible through the stomach or duodenum. But before doing endoscopic drainage, it is also uh, paramount that you have a surgical and interventional radiology backup available when you do the endoscopic drainage. What are the uh, contraindications for endoscopic transmural drainage? So number one, if the wall thickness of your cyst and um, the duodenum or stomach is about one centimeter or more, or if the cyst location is in a remote area in which you cannot access easily or through the usual channels of the stomach and the duodenum. You can not also drain a pseudocyst with a pseudoaneurysm in its wall because of the increased risk of hemorrhaging. Number three, if you cannot find a vascular window for puncture, as common sense uh, dictates, again, this will turn into a bleeding uh, lesion. Number four, organize collections with solid necrosis and minimal fluids. 
are not also candidates for transmural drainage, but this is a relative contraindication because you can actually put large metallic stents and um, extract all the necrotic debris endoscopically as well. But we're talking about pseudocysts. Okay? If you employ the transpapillary drainage technique, in which you place a pancreatic stent with or without a pancreatic sphincterotomy to drain a pseudocyst that communicates with the pancreatic duct. This is used especially if your pseudocyst is small. Generally, the dictum is less than five centimeters. And these are not approached transmurally because of their small size. Technically, they're difficult to drain if they're small. The end of the stent may directly enter the cyst or you bridge the area of the leak. The transpapillary drainage technique actually has less bleeding rates and less perforation rates compared to your um, transmural drainage. For transmural drainage, it is performed by entering the collection directly using a needle with or without electrocautery, such as uh, using f &E needles, needle knives, dilators, and cystotomes after which you place stents, either plastic or metal, to drain the pseudocyst. Comparing both transmural versus transpapillary approach depends again on the clinical setting of, the, of, of, of where you are and what your patient has. AUS is still the standard of care for transmural drainage nowadays. Large symptomatic mature collections abutting the stomach or duodenum with less than one centimeter thickness. Transmural puncture through the gastric or duodenal wall is preferred. It allows also placement of multiple plastic stents or large caliber stents such as your metal stents. In patients with complete obstruction of the pancreatic duct, transmural puncture is obviously the only feasible technique for drainage. In patients with small pseudocysts, really small, like less than three centimeters, and communicating with the main pancreatic duct, these are the ideal candidates for transpapillary stent placement as initial therapy. They provide continuous drainage of the pancreatic fluid and facilitates resolution of that pancreatic ductal disruption responsible for the formation of your pseudocyst. So once the pseudocyst cavity is successfully entered, a transmural tract balloon is dilated, usually four millimeters up to eight millimeters. And this allows placement of your double pigtail stents. One or two pigtail stents is usually suffices. Covered self-expandable metal stents or LAMPs are now being used more instead of or in addition to plastic stents. And this is because the metal stents you only need one, one single stem. It simplifies and shortens the procedure, and you don't need to dilate because some of these uh, deployment, um, its deployment is usually in one step because it has a built-in cystotome, et cetera. Plus the stent lumen diameter is bigger, usually more than 10 millimeters, thus facilitating a rapid drainage of cyst contents compared to your smaller diameter plastic stents. And, it, and furthermore, it thus reduces the risk of stent occlusion. It has broad anchoring flanges. That's why it looks like a dumbbell to prevent migration. You can also have the potential to enter the collection repeatedly and more easily with a gastroscope if you have a stent lumen diameter of more than 10, 10 millimeters. And you can perform necrosectomy if there's some a little bit of debris inside your pseudocyst. So this is an example of US guided drainage um, uh, deploying plastic stents. So you puncture the pseudocyst, and then you coil a wire around several times inside the pseudocyst, and then you deploy your stents one after the other. So this is the first plastic stent, and then the second plastic stent is put in, And then these stents are then removed in six weeks or more. Next one is a metal stent called the Axios, in which it's faster because once you puncture through, 
then you're actually ready to deploy the stent immediately. This is performed by deploying the distal um, flang flange first, pulling it back so that the cyst opposes to your stomach or duodenal wall, and then you deploy the proximal flange. And this actually shortens everything. And this metal stent can also be dilated to increase the diameter quickly, then wait for it to expand, thus increasing drainage rapidly for your pseudocysts. Comparing lamps or lumen opposing metal stents versus plastic stents in the management of pancreatic pseudocysts has been a large deb debate during these past few years. And Yang et al. studied 205 adult patients with pancreatic pseudocysts investigating um, this, comparing lumen opposing metal stents with double pigtail stents in terms of clinical success, recurrence, and need for surgery, and even adverse events. Yang noted in uh, his results that clinical success rates were better with your lumen opposing stents. And the need for placement of a percutaneous drain after is also lower for your lumen opposing stents. In terms of adverse events, he reported that plastic stents actually have a higher rate of adverse events compared to your lumen opposing stents. Further studies uh, with the same uh, topic, Tan et al. also studied 772 patients in seven cohort studies using meta-analysis in comparing lamps and uh, your plastic stents with outcomes of clinical success. And his results show that in technical success rates for drainage of pseudocysts, it favors lumen opposing metal stents. But mortality rates comparing uh, drainage with lamps versus plastic stent was the same. The rates were not significantly different. Another study by Bang comparing metal and plastic stents for transmural drainage of pancreatic fluid collection, also a systematic review reported the following. Treatment success rates were the same, either you use metal stent or plastic stent. Adverse events were also the same, even if you use metal stent or plastic stent. And even recurrence rates of your pseudocysts were the same if you use metal stents or plastic stents. And this uh, results um, prodded them to give a conclusion that current evidence does not support routine placement of metal stents for transmural drainage of PFCs because they have the same outcomes. But randomized trials are needed to justify the use of metal stents for uh, pancreatic fluid collections. So if you think about it, advantages of self-expanding metal stents compared with plastic Double pigtails, pigtail stents is still currently being debated. And although plastic stents are generally cheaper, advantages of lambs in pseudocysts are they provide faster drainage. Thus, you also have faster procedure time, specifically for lambs with cautery enabled catheters. And it gives you the ability to access cyst contents if needed because of their large lumen. Current studies, however, do not conclusively show advantages of one over the other in terms of clinical success rates, such as mortality, morbidity, recurrence rates, or even hospital stay. How about comparing the different modalities to drain pancreatic pseudocysts? Comparing endoscopic and surgical drainage for pancreatic pseudocysts, um, Varadara Julu performed a randomized trial of 20 endoscopically drained pseudocysts versus 20 surgically drained pseudocysts with the primary endpoint of pseudocyst recurrence after a 24-month follow-up period. His results showed that hospital stay, median days, is better 
for the endoscopic drainage technique. And even hospital costs are cheaper or lower with endoscopic drainage compared to your surgical intervention. Farias also compared endoscopic versus surgical treatment of pseudocysts in terms of treatment success rates, drainage-related events, and days of hospitalization. And he, he did a meta-analysis and systematic review. He reported um, therapeutic success rates favored the metal stent group or the LAMPS group, but this was not significant. And the heterogeneity of this, the studies were very high. In terms of adverse events, LAMPS versus plastic stents were the same, were no different, uh, significant differences. Hospital stay, however, favored endoscopic drainage significantly over your surgical drainage. And this was followed by several other studies which actually said the same, that endoscopic drainage is significantly superior in terms of lowered costs and shorter hospital stays. How about percutaneous versus endoscopic drainage? Juan et al. studied 129 patients with pancreatic fluid collections, 59 with pseudocysts, and 70 with Vaughn. And outcomes uh, measured were clinical success, reintervention, and hospital stay. He noted that initial success rates were better with endoscopic drainage, reintervention was less with endoscopic drainage, and mean hospital days was lesser or uh, better with your endoscopic drainage technique versus your percutaneous drainage technique. In terms of adverse events, particularly hemorrhaging, endoscopic drainage significantly is better with less adverse events. Again, particularly hemorrhage, hemorrhaging in your uh, patients. Comparing all of these modalities, percutaneous, endoscopic, and surgical, Professor Theo and um, et al. did a systematic review and compared all of these. They gathered 10 studies from the 1960s up to 2009 and answer these questions. Their results show that in comparing percutaneous versus surgical drainage of pancreatic pseudocysts, you would note that surgical drainage had lesser adverse events and shorter hospital stays. For endoscopic ultrasound versus surgical drainage of pancreatic pseudocysts, it is a um, uh, uh, unanimous that the studies have shown that endoscopic ultrasound have shorter hospital stays compared to your surgical drainage intervention of pancreatic pseudocysts. Comparing endoscopic ultrasound versus EGD guided drainage or just visually guided drainage of pancreatic pseudocysts showed a higher clinical success rate of 100% for endoscopic ultrasound compared to 33% for EGD-guided drainage of pancreatic pseudocysts. How about combining the treatments? So endoscopy-guided transmural drainage can, all, can be combined with other modalities such as transpapillary stent placement and drainage or radiology-guided percutaneous drainage. But because of the high success rates of EOS-guided drainage alone, or even transpapillary stent placement alone, sp specifically in well-selected patients, combined procedures I've mentioned should be limited to special situations such as recurrent pseudocysts or, or a pseudocyst with a pancreatic duct stricture. So ladies and gentlemen, in summary, pancreatic pseudocysts should be drained if patient remains symptomatic in pain, patient is septic or the cyst has already been infected, or if the cyst is large or increasing in size. Most pseudocysts now can be safely drained endoscopically, which is the first line treatment, with percutaneous or surgical methods considered a second line. Plastic or metal stents can be both employed with equal clinical success rates and outcomes, but 
Metal stents offer faster procedure times. Me uh, plastic stents, on the other hand, are still cheaper. Finally, always perform endoscopic drainage with interventional radio and surgical support so that you'll have higher success rates. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, kids, for that excellent talk. So we now have some questions for you. Now, uh, I'd like to thank you for seeing the need to have surgical and interventional radio backup. Now, it's not just being able to do it or having been done it several times that you would be very, I mean, feeling safe. Now, you should always have the backup. And you have yes. discussed that in your talk. So that, that's very, very good, especially for the younger guys. So we have a question here from uh, Dr. Lazaro. Yes. Question is, for so this is, how long can the metal or plastic stand stay? Or if they have to be removed, when is the best time to remove them? All right, so um, that's a very good question. I think Dr. Lazaro knows the answer to that. But um, basically, <laughs> Uh, because the metal stents have a bigger um, lumen, luminal diameter, so the drainage of the pseudocyst contents is faster. So you run the risk of the pseudocyst decreasing in size also rapidly. And this may cause bleeding when the metal stent rubs on the other outer wall of a, or the inner wall of the cyst, especially if there's a blood vessel there. So in essence, with metal stents, it's better to remove them in about three weeks, because that's the usual time that the pseudocyst shrinks. Personally, I remove them in two and a half weeks. <laughs> I said, yun yung aking napansin, that's the magical number for me. For plastic stents, usually you can remove them in six weeks, because again, that's the time that usually shrink. But the studies are usually on single plastic stents and double plastic stents. So if you place double plastic stents, you might need to remove the stents earlier, like four weeks. And if you just put one plastic stent, you might need to remove it um, much later, more than six weeks. Well, here in the country, we, you know that EOS is not readily available and not everybody is able to do, can do the uh, US trainings. So can the recommendations yeah. change a bit? Of course they can. So. <laughs> Um, not just because of the financial aspect of it, Dr. Ong, because mas mura pa rin ang plastic stent, but also because we don't have EUS available in our um, centers. Um, but the endoscopy should be very adept in um, reading CT scans now because he has to take uh, a look, a very good look. For example, he is planning on doing endos endoscopically guided to this drainage without the benefit of ultrasound. So he has to find a window where he can puncture safely. Generally, a bulging uh, pseudocyst, which is go going inside the, the stomach lumen, is much safer than a non-bulging uh, pseudocyst because studies have shown if you do puncture without ultrasound guidance in a non-bulging pseudocyst, bleeding is actually higher. Okay, we have a question here from Dr. Ayawal. How about long-term outcomes of the three modalities? Are they comparable or not? And what about recurrence? Okay, so um, there are very few uh, studies on long-term uh, outcomes for pseudocyst drainage. But basically, if you compare surgical and then endoscopic outcomes, they actually are the same in terms of clinical outcomes. Um, but the only differences are that endoscopic um, modalities such as US guided pseudocyst drainaging is uh, beneficial in terms of hospital stay. It shortens the hospital stay, but in terms of mortalities, in terms of adverse events, etc., they're all the same. Um, for percutaneous, there are even mo mo less studies on it on terms of long-term outcomes because because of the advent of endoscopic ultrasound guided uh, intervention. Um, but basically, on the small studies that we have, 
EUS guided drainage has better outcomes than your percutaneous drainage. Look, we have two short questions uh, because we're running out of time. Uh, first is, should we do MRCP before all EUS synthesis drainage to check for the disconnection? And the second is, do we need imaging prior to removal of stents? Okay, good questions. So I personally would recommend you do an MRCP to check for connections of the pancreatic duct to your pseudocyst drainage because it might change your, 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 your drainage technique. Um, a pseudocyst that is connected to a pancreatic duct and has a small size would benefit more from a transpapillary drainage technique. But if it's big, even though it's connected to the pancreatic duct, a transmural can also suffice. But in some studies, it's better to both transpapillary and a transmural to facilitate drainage. And for imaging before removing the stents, I usually do it to check if the cyst has decreased in size. But if you have EUS available uh, during the removal, I actually just use EUS and not do uh, CT scans anymore. Ideally, you should have CT scans and EUS. But again, we're in, in the Philippines. So uh, the most cost-effective method I'm employing right now is that since I have EUS on hand in my hospital, I just ask them to come back after three weeks for metal stent after six weeks for plastic stents, and then check if the pseudocyst has shrunk, and then I remove the stents. Okay, we have a few more questions. So may I request kids to please answer them in the Q&A box because <laughs> we'll move on to the next All topic. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Our next topic is one of the most dreaded complications of severe pancreatitis. And we have selected three able and young speakers for this topic. The first one is a surgeon, Dr. Jonathan Nolasco, who is a fellow of the Philippine Association of Hepatopancreatobiliary Surgeons. He's a fellow of the Philippine College of Surgeons a member of the Philippine Association of Laparoscopic and Endoscopic Surgeons, member of International Hepatopancreatic Obituary Association. He is now the chief of the section of Hepatopancreatic Obituary Surgery at UERM, where he also holds the rank of an assistant professor in the same institution. He is a member of the fellowship training committee for surgery fellowship training at the St. Louis Medical Center, QC, as well as the residence training committee of the Department of Surgery of St. Louis Medical Center, Global City. He is also an examiner of the Philippine Board of Surgery. Our second speaker for this topic is Dr. Ricardo De Castro for the radiologic debridement. He obtained his medical degree from the Athenian School of Medicine and Public Health. He is a fellow of the Philippine College of Radiology. He obtained his residency in diagnostic radiology at St. Louis Medical Center, QC, and fellowship in international, interventional rather, radiology at St. Louis Medical Center, Global City. And a third, but not the least, of course, is to talk on the endoscopic approach to the abridgment of pancreatic necrosis. The third speaker is Dr. Jonard Cole. He is a graduate of the University of the East and obtained his residency in internal medicine at Chinese General Hospital. Fellowship was at University Hospital. He, ha he had his research fellowship in therapeutic endoscopy at the University of Sydney, Westmead West Hospital in Sydney. He is now an active consultant at St. Louis Medical Center, BGC, and the Chinese General Hospital. He is a member of the Asian ES Group and the Asian NBI Group. So now let's start and let's have Dr. Nolasco for the first talk. One, two, three. Good afternoon. So I'm tasked to talk about one of three ways to deal with pancreatic necrosis and that is surgical necrosectomy. 
I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. I'm going to start my talk with this video, but I'll have to beg your pardon because although most of us here will have lived long enough to witness the toxic days of open necrosectomy, but like the current Instagram generation, back then we were really poor at documenting and uh, taking videos of our cases. So I will have to rely on this YouTube video. The surgery was uh, done in Italy, and it is a case of open necrosectomy done around 12 days from the onset of pancreatitis. Uh, the abdomen is entered through this huge bilateral subcostal incision. The ascites is drained, and once the abdominal cavity is entered, you notice it can be a bit bloody. All the edema and the tissue planes are not very distinct. You can understand from here why we occasionally get enterocutaneous fistulas from cases like these. Now you will see the piecemeal debridement of pancreatic tissue. The necrosis here is not very well demarcated, I think, because it is quite early, so that the, the surgeon may have to use scissors sometimes instead of just pulling and, and suctioning out the necrosis. Occasionally, also, there may be some uh, bleeding vessels that need to be sutured. Uh, after all this is done, the cavity is packed with gauze and the abdomen is closed with plastic bags or even zippers sometimes or any form of temporary closure of the abdominal wall because this case is going to be reopened in 48 hours either to remove those packings or even repeat the necrosectomy. Now, seeing a video like this, it's almost like this ends our discussion for today on the disadvantages of surgical necrosectomy. But this was uh, practiced before the 21st century, although it's still being done currently and uh, when indicated. So the mortality back then is up to 56% and morbidity even higher. Oh, this European survey that ran from 2002 to 2003 showed that 43% of surgeons back then would operate within the first two weeks of the onset of pancreatitis, while another 28%, and therefore a total of more than two thirds, would operate within the first three weeks. Furthermore, 26% would do necrosectomy for sterile necrosis even after a negative FNA. Now, the landscape of, of pancreatitis care has changed since then. And although most studies are of low quality, uh, but they have been quite extensively reviewed and, and in fact are part of uh, guidelines of many societies such as these that appear on this slide plus several others that cannot fit into this slide anymore. And they're quite unanimous in saying at least three things. Uh, the first being that the most or the indication for, for necrosectomy is mainly in infected necrosis. And second is that whenever available and or feasible, minimally invasive techniques are preferred. And third is, Whenever surgical uh, uh, intervention is required, it is to be delayed for at least four weeks. Or with that, the mortality has been brought down to half or even zero in many cases. So we're going from this to this one. Oh, in current video assisted retroperitoneal debridement, there would be a four to five centimeter incision right between these two catheters here. So that today, when we talk about surgery for pancreatic necrosis, we are talking within the context of the currently recommended so-called step-up approach. And surgery can be any one of these three, 
first the traditional open surgery, which is less uh, these days, although still occasionally required. And for the most part, it's either laparoscopic or video-assisted retroperitoneal debridement, or in short, PARD. Now, I don't want to preempt the talk of the two speakers to follow, but when we say advantages and disadvantages, inevitably we will have to compare with other modalities. In general, we want to look at success rates, recurrence rates, and the need for repeated necrosectomies, whether through the same modality or, or crossing over to another form of treatment. Of course, we want to know the complications and hopefully, hopefully the costs. Now, some evidence for surgical step-up approach. Well, again, the studies mostly are small series, and this one is actually the largest RCT to date. Uh, it's called the tension trial. And what they found was um, in the endoscopy group, majority required two or more uh, necrosectomy sessions. Uh, note that uh, we disregarded the 43% here because zero means um, that endoscopic drainage only uh, was needed and without the need for necrosectomy. Right. Compare this to the surgical group where majority required only one uh, necrosectomy. Furthermore, uh, in the endoscopy group, about one third required additional percutaneous training or even surgery. While in the surgery group, only 4% required an additional procedure and that is drainage only without the need for any more necrosectomies. But therefore, surgical necrosectomy may be more successful with less sessions needed. Uh, looking at this case, this is actually a case of duodenal perforation rather than pancreatitis per se. But to demonstrate the point, you see here in the right retroperitoneum, there's a lot of uh, bubbles from infected necrosis, in fact, extending all the way down to the pelvis, although not visible in this cut. Now, cases like this may not be amenable to endoscopic therapy. It may require surgery or sometimes percutaneous drainage with multiple catheters. Now, in fact, in the attention trial, uh, it was mentioned that some of the cases that require the crossover to surgical uh, approach were because of um, uh, necrosis in these locations that are difficult to access endoscopically. Uh, some more evidence for surgical necrosectomy. This time, let's look at the laparoscopic technique. Again, uh, small series, few patients, but the success rate is up to 100%. And this has not been equal uh, in reports of endoscopic necrosectomy. But going back to the tension trial, looking at the some complications of any of the procedures, uh, the point I want to drive at here is we look at the, the complications like bleeding and visceral perforation. Uh, they in fact they occur in in both uh, endoscopic and surgical uh, groups and are not significantly different. The only thing uh, significantly different here is, is the rate of pancreatic fistula, which is higher in the surgical group. The other thing is incisional hernias or they're not statistically significant in this study, maybe because only one occurred, but common sense tells us that incisional hernias are not going to occur in endoscopy as proven in this 10-year um, follow-up to the original panther trial which many of us here are familiar with uh, they found that um, after 10 years of follow-up 39 percent of, of patients who had surgery developed incisional hernia now about Visceral perforations, again, they occur in both groups. The difference is that 
there are more gastric perforations in the endoscopy group, while in the surgery group, uh, there is more of bowel perforations. Uh, this study, though, is not very well designed and it's not a randomized trial. Now, as I started with the video, I'm all, almost going to close with another one, but this time this is real. And I chose to, to I chose this uh, video of open necrosectomy again because I think it demonstrates better the point. And I, I feel that you may have seen uh, quite a number of BARD videos. So let me just orient you. Uh, down here across the bottom would be the transverse colon retracted by the hand. This is the stomach up here. So this is not a transgastric approach. This is an open approach through the lesser sac. And this here will be the very thick wall of the necrosis. So this case was done six to eight weeks after the onset of pain. And you can see the necrosum coming out almost in a whole piece and very minimal bleeding. This is the specimen here. A uh, picture paints a thousand words and I think more so with the video so that there are several things we can conclude from, from this video here. First is that if only we can wait long enough and the debridement will be much easier and much safer for the patient. Second is, despite being claimed by only one paper that all necrosis will eventually liquefy in less than a month, in, in reality, not all necrosis liquefies and therefore may need some form of mechanical debridement in, rather than just drainage alone. The third one is looking at the open debridement using those large instruments, um, it is easier to, to take out the necrosis in huge chunks as compared to the small tip instruments of laparoscopy and much less in endoscopy. And also the bleeding is much easier to control in open or even laparoscopic surgery as compared to endoscopy, I would imagine. Now, um, this cartoon depicts the level of confidence that, or courageousness actually that we have. In my mind, as we do the necrosectomies, I picture the endoscopist as like a foot soldier who, who does so much work doing the necrosectomy, but is faced with a bit of fear and vulnerability to bleeding. In BARD, you're quite accurate looking through that telescope, peeking through and working through a small hole, though uh, you have some still some vulnerability to, to bleeding complications. Comparing to laparoscopic or open uh, necrosectomy, where we have with us more arms at our disposal, and we are a bit braver. And who would this be? Um, this is the attending physician who is neither a surgeon nor an endoscopist. And so sila yung nagsasabing, sige, tirahin mo na para pauwi na natin ang pasyente. So they are always the bravest of us all. No. This is not meant to spook you or anyone, though. In fact, if you can look at the glass half full, it is actually quite encouraging. You know, seeing that very thick wall seems to be so safe from perforation and looking at that necrotic tissue coming off quite easily from, from normal uh, structures, it seems whatever means we use, laparoscopic, Part or endoscopy, uh, it seems doable and, and therefore encouraging. Actually, I would encourage the endoscopists here to perform more of these procedures so that the patient may have the benefit of being spared from major surgery. 
So in summary, the advantages of surgical necrosectomy are as follows. First, all locations are potentially accessible through surgery compared with uh, percutaneous catheter drainage alone or endoscopy even with less sessions needed. Now, simultaneous procedures can also be done such as cholecystectomy, although this is much less of a concern these days, uh, much less than um, dealing with the infection. Now, and at least in the Philippines, surgery even laparoscopic surgery is widely available, while endoscopic expertise for that kind of intervention, you know, not to mention the, the materials used, are not widely available. And even interventional radiologists are not as many in the country. Uh, this column here that says need studies, this is just a politically correct term for or saying what I feel about it. This is only what I think. Uh, is that bleeding is more easily controlled with surgery, whether laparoscopic or open, compared to endoscopy. And there is less technical skill required even for VARD, and therefore less um, learning curve. Well, the last one is cost, with big question marks because Although there are already studies done in the U.S. and Europe that show cost is less uh, in endoscopy throughout the course until full recovery, um, I think the situation will be different um, in our country um, because the PF of surgeons is peanuts compared to endoscopies. Of course, I'm kidding. Uh, but just to demonstrate, actually, in VARD, you need very little special instruments. You only need the ordinary laparoscope and some basic instruments to pull out the necrosis. And therefore, it should not be any more expensive than a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So that's how I feel about it. And the stents being used for endoscopic necrosectomy typically will cost. I think around 100,000 or more even. So for the disadvantages, there is a higher pancreatic fistula rate in surgical necrosectomy. And at least for open surgery, the mortality is still higher because of the induced inflammatory response syndrome with big surgeries. And if laparoscopic or open transperitoneal um, a debridement is done, then there is potential for spreading the infection of what is an otherwise already walled up retroperitoneal necrosis. And in VARD, even if you are able to do the necrosectomy in one session, it is not actually just one procedure if you count the, the required percutaneous catheter insertion prior to doing the VARD. Other complications are unique to surgery, of course, such as incisional hernias. I'm going to skip this uh, in the interest of time. So to conclude, the step-up approach is the current standard in the management of infected necrosis. And whether you do endoscopic or surgical uh, necrosectomy, they should have comparable results and even uh, uh, rates of complications. Although endoscopic necrosectomy may need more sessions, and on the other hand, there is a higher pancreatic fistula rate in surgical necrosectomy. Uh, having said that, though, a certain subset of patients will still require surgery either at the outset or ultimately if the other modalities fail. In many cases, it will be combined therapy, actually. Well, next year's uh, PCS Mid-Year Convention topic will be classic surgery in the current era. I'm thinking if they do this five years or 10 years from now, then surgical necrosectomy could be one of these topics, uh, virtually one for the history books, uh, just like uh, peptic ulcer surgery is rarely done these days. 
um, if more and more endoscopic necrosectomies can be uh, done as development progresses. With that, I thank you all. It is a great honor and pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, good afternoon, I'm Dr. De Castro. I'm an interventional radiologist, and uh, I will um, lecture on the roles of interventional radiology in pancreatic necrosis, uh, particularly for uh, acute uh, pancreatic necrosis collections and uh, for the more chronic uh, type, which is your Waldorf necrosis. And I'll begin by discussing a few uh, common findings on your CT images of pancreatic necrosis. Uh, so here we have a contrast-enhanced uh, actual CT scan, which um, will help us delineate uh, portions of the pancreas that is either viable or uh, demonstrate necrosis. So, this is an example of a combined pancreatic and peripancreatic necrosis. And we will, if you can see the pancreas here, normally it should enhance uh, as delineated by the black arrow here, uh, the pancreatic tail. But if you look at the body, uh, as noted by the asterisk, uh, there is no more enhancement uh, signifying necrosis in the area. There is also a large, hypodense area here, the mark, um, marked by the white arrows, uh, signifying a large acute necrotic collection for your AMC. Uh, next, we have a, another type of collection, which is uh, peripancreatic necrosis without involvement of your pancreas. So the difference between uh, this one in contrast to the uh, earlier uh, images is the mixed densities of these collections. So if you look at the area uh, marked by the white arrows, there are hypodense areas mixed by uh, brighter or hyperdense areas, which um, denotes fluid and non-liquefied components of the collection, or the acute necrotic uh, collection. Um, we also see the pancreas here, which does not show any um, discrete hypodensities or uh, non-enhancement, uh, which shows the uh, absence of necrosis in the pancreas. Next, we have a more chronic type of collection. Uh, so this is what we see when we have a walled off necrosis. Uh, the area here, uh, marked by the asterisk, are a mixed collection of uh, both fat and the non liquefied uh, components of the uh, necrosis uh, in the pancreas. And the area here, marked by the white arrows, are actually residual enhancing portions of the uh, uh, pancreas uh, parenchyma. So there's uh, still a small portion of viable uh, pancreatic tissue with the uh, encapsulated collection of necrotic tissue. This is an example of your Waldorf necrosis. So it's important to note uh, that there are some pitfalls with uh, images seen on your CT scan. So this is one example. Um, as you saw earlier, the hypodense areas in the collection um, usually denote uh, liquefied portions of, of the collection. So the hypodense or the darker areas here, uh, bounded by this encapsulating wall, uh, noted by the arrows, uh, we would presume that this collection is uh, more liquid. But when we correlate it with an MRI, a T2-weighted image shows uh, a more accurate uh, depiction of the fluid content of the collection. So with the images, uh, we expect a higher signal or hyper intensity to be white, signifying fluid content. So as compared to the earlier images on CT, we see that it's actually darker in the, the collection and only a few areas are bright or hyper intense signifying fluid. So it's uh, one of the things we should consider when planning the uh, treatment of the patient in such necrotic collections. So MRI can help us uh, plan or strategize the appropriate treatment for these patients. 
So it's also important because uh, since we confirmed that these are non liquefied uh, uh, materials within the collection, uh, these patients may not be amenable for catheter drainage if we plan to do so. Okay. So white arrows again signify the uh, liquid signal intensity. So this is just to compare the two. Uh, you see here the uh, supposedly liquid content of the collection, very confirmed with MRI that it's not actually uh, predominantly fluid. It's actually more of solid, uh, signifying your non liquefied material in the world of necrosis. So uh, I'll just discuss a few of the procedures that uh, interventional radiology can offer in the management of uh, these patients with pancreatic necrosis. So one of the more uh, less invasive procedures is your uh, CT-guided percutaneous spine needle aspiration. So there is some debate regarding the use of this uh, procedure, uh, but it's mainly used as a diagnostic um, to help uh, establish infection, especially in uh, clinching the etiology, uh, etiologic organism in uh, infections or to confirm the presence of infections in the pancreatic collection. So uh, sometimes it uh, can be a diagnostic dilemma as uh, not all pancreatic collections um, are uh, present with, um, with infection even in the setting of sepsis. So aspiration can confirm the presence of an infection to, to treat accordingly. So here's an example of your fine needle aspiration. Uh, the white arrow um, marks the Chiba needle, which was used to access a fluid collection in the pancreatic necrosis. And then the black arrow signifies, uh, marks the air locule, so, which is highly suspicious for an infection. And that's why the FNA was able to confirm the presence of infection in this patient. For the next procedure, uh, which is actually the more def definitive uh, one, that uh, most preferred to perform is uh, your percutaneous catheter drainage. Um, it involves insertion of a catheter to drain either the, a sterile symptomatic or a confirmed infective uh, collection in pancreatic necrosis. So it can provide definitive therapy for a certain number of patients, but more often than not, it's um, used as a bridge. Uh, for a step up approach to either surgical or endoscopic or vasectomy of these patients, especially in more complicated or uh, uh, patients. So, here's an example of the catheters that you can use. Uh, usually, it's a locking pigtail with a cope loop at the end. So, this is our cope loop to secure the catheter in the, um, the cavity of the fluid collection. So when we do these procedures, uh, the preferred imaging modality to guide the access of the needles and the placement of the catheters is um, CT uh, over ultrasound, mainly because of its um, several advantages. Uh, the most important, of course, is its superiority with its spatial resolution uh, to, to find the uh, vital structures surrounding the pancreatic collection. And it also allows intraoperative visualization of nearby bowel and other critical structures. Um, it can also be used uh, in reference to a previous CT scan that was done with contrast to make a uh, rough um, map or, or a road map of the vascular structures to avoid them during um, introduction of the catheters. Uh, it can also provide immediate intra-procedural uh, post drainage assessment um, to identify residual fluid when we start draining and after draining, also to investigate for other possible extensions of the uh, necrotic fluid collections or the necrotic collection, uh, and planning for additional catheter insertions if needed. So the catheters can be used, uh, insertion of the catheter for drainage uh, can be used if uh, there are cases when endoscopic drainage is not available, uh, particularly in 
um, certain hospitals where an endoscopy unit might not yet be available, or if the technique of uh, endoscopic transmural drainage might not be technically feasible. Um, percutaneous catheter drainage is uh, an alternative that could be considered. It can also aid uh, patients who have already undergone uh, endoscopic stent uh, in order to drain the, uh, the fluid collections, uh, which usually uh, it could be a transmural stent insertion uh, into the pancreatic collection. Uh, the percutaneous catheter can uh, aid in the drainage where when the collection is far from the stent, uh, particularly in the extension of fluid into the pericardic gutters or the pelvis. And another advantage uh, is because of the external nature of these drains, um, when the collection is, um, there are mixed uh, non-liquefied or there is necrotic debris within the collection, uh, because of the external nature of the drain, we could allow um, irrigation at bedside to expedite clearance of uh, these materials. So um, it's also safe to use uh, during the acute necrotizing uh, phase of the pancreatitis. It's also uh, a good and uh, effective uh, drainage or source control in suspected or confirmed infected necrosis. And uh, it's also suggested for patients who are too ill to undergo um, either an endoscopic transmural drainage or even surgery. And lastly, the catheter tract, uh, especially when it matures, uh, it can help uh, uh, give an access uh, to other minimally invasive debridement methods. So it can provide a portal for the BARD or your STE to access the uh, collections uh, because of the existing track. So here's just a few images that would, uh, that demonstrate uh, the insertion of uh, drainage. Uh, here we have an image of a plain actual CT. So uh, we see the needle uh, marked by the white arrow. So uh, it could either be a Chiba or any introducer needle that would access the uh, fluid collection percutaneously. So we see here, uh, marked by the asterisk, uh, as we saw earlier, uh, this is typical for, for your wall of necrosis. There is a thick wall encapsulating hyperdense. Uh, collection. So it's marked by the asterisk there. And then next, uh, we see the introduction of a guide wire uh, into the cavity of the Waldorf necrosis, as noted by the white arrow. And uh, you should uh, loop the, the guide wire uh, securely uh, with, by measuring the distance from the skin with the images so that we could uh, exchange catheters and place the loop accordingly within the, the cavity. And lastly, here we have a catheter uh, with its uh, locking cope loop uh, secured within the uh, abs uh, cavity of the wall of necrosis. So fortunately for this patient and so, uh, other patients as well who respond to the drainage, uh, follow up uh, after four months uh, showed complete solution of the walls of necrosis. So, certain patients uh, do benefit from uh, just doing percutaneous catheter change alone, uh, provided there are not uh, too many comorbidities or complications present. So, catheter drainage has its own disadvantages. So. Uh, the main disadvantage is, of course, the possibility of creating a pancreatal cutaneous fistula. So it's a complication we do not want to, uh, to encounter. Um, there are certain procedures uh, that can be an, an alternative to external, uh, external drainage. Uh, we could use a double pigtail stents, uh, and several techniques that, uh, are used to introduce these. Uh, it could be uh, done endoscopically, percutaneously, PCT, or gyroscopic guidance. And uh, an example would be this. Um, see what they do is that uh, they insert transgastric uh, to the transmurine from the stomach, 
uh, one end of the pigtail stem and then introduce the other end into the uh, necrotic collection. And then the drainage would just be, uh, trans uh, be transmitted transmurely. Another disadvantage is that your non-liquefied material may not drain effectively. So as we saw earlier, MRI can confirm it. Uh, planning strategies to uh, treat these patients. Uh, MRI could be um, a useful tool to decide which treatment would be best. Also, um, another consideration would be to use a um, upsizing of the catheters to larger bore uh, in order to drain the uh, bigger or the thicker uh, non liquefied components of the collection. And also, uh, in, in an example of the larger uh, bore, uh, you can accommodate uh, 20 French uh, and, or even larger uh, French catheters as well. And catheter drainage use, uh, may also require prolonged drainage to treat the collection. And as you saw earlier, uh, the patient, one of the patients uh, took as long as four months or longer to completely resolve the, the, the collection. Thank you for your time. Any references? Our next. Good afternoon. Congratulations to the organizers for an excellent and timely meeting. Thank you for inviting as well. I am tasked today to convince you about endotherapy of pancreatic necrosis. We are here to emphasize that patient selection is important. There are advantages and disadvantages of endoscopic treatment of pancreatic necrosis. We can show a case to top it off that it is doable. We need to revisit the Atlanta classification, which I think has been discussed by the other speakers earlier. The key number is four weeks. After four weeks, the necrosis can organize into a pancreatic pseudosis or a world of necrosis. There are radiologic criteria that are present in each entity, and you need to always talk to your abdominal radiologist to make the proper classification. Once the criteria is met along with matured cyst wall in a symptomatic patient, we then decide to do cyst gastrostomy. The choice would be between double pigtail stents or lumen opposing metal stents. Endoscopic necrosectomy is done when there is a need for world of necrosis. The cyst or world of necrosis is accessed by the EUS. Once metallic stent is deployed, a small caliber scope can be inserted into the cyst cavity to do debridement and necrosectomy. This can be a repeated procedure until the necrotic debris is eradicated or cleared, as seen in the last three pictures in C1, C2, and C3. How does endoscopic management of necrosis fare against surgical and radiologic? We start by comparing endoscopy versus surgical management as explained in this clinical review published in 2019. Among RCTs and observational studies, the mortality rates favors endoscopy. Even accounting for minimally invasive surgery, benefit against mortality still favors endoscopy. The risk of organ failure is smaller in endoscopy against surgery. The rates of adverse events favors endoscopy as well. There is less risk of bleeding compared to surgery when you do endoscopic therapy. And most of all, the patients stay in hospital less among endoscopically treated 
pancreatic necrosis. Now, this systematic review and meta-analysis compares the endoscopic management against percutaneous management for symptomatic pancreatic fluid collection. There is better clinical success in endoscopic against percutaneous therapy. Between the two, the technical success is almost equal. However, adverse events are less in endoscopic therapy against percutaneous therapy. Though the recurrence rate touches comparable results territory, the results still favors endoscopic treatment against percutaneous. And most of all, there is less hospital stay and the need for re-intervention in the endoscopic treatment against percutaneous. For the disadvantages, there are complications that cannot be laughed about. Bleeding, perforation, maldeployment, gas embolism, sepsis, aspiration pneumonia can occur periprocedurally. Furthermore, mucosal complications, bleeding, stent migration, stent obstruction, late perforation, compression and fistulization, and buried stent can occur as delayed complications. These are complications which can inadvertently occur, which can happen, and is quite a nightmare to encounter. We then need really to follow the indications for intervention. Infection can occur in fluid collection since this is a rich source of food for microorganisms. Persistent organ failure heralds the need for intervention. Even if the necrosis is sterile, gastric outlet, intestinal and biliary obstruction, persistent pain or the state of unwellness, symptomatic disconnected pancreatic duct are strong indications for intervention. So, we encountered a 71-year-old female who has comorbidities coming in with acute necrotizing pancreatitis. She was discharged within 7 days in the hospital, and this is the initial CT scan. On follow-up, 4 weeks later, a repeat CT scan was done showing a cystic lesion. She suffered early satiety, nausea, bloatedness, on and off abdominal pain and occasional fever. We, de we then decided to intervene endoscopically. The materials used were a gauge 19 aspiration needle, cystotome, and a fully covered self-expandable metal stent, the Nagi stent by Taiwan. On EUS, a large cystic lesion measuring more than 5 cm seen at the pancreatic body. The area between the cyst and gastric wall was assessed for vessels which showed to be absent in a certain window. The distance between needle tip and the cyst was measured as well. The gauge 19 echo tip needle was punctured into the cyst followed by aspiration of cyst fluid for culture, sensitivity, and cytology. A guide wire was then looped into the cyst cavity, and the trap was created with a cystotome. The stent is then deployed after the stent introducer is seen inside the cyst. The cyst is then fully expanded. Cystotome was used to create the trap for inserting the stent introducer. Herbe electrosurgical unit at cutting mode was done. After introducing the sheet into the cyst, the stent was slowly deployed, placing the intracystic flange under fluoroscopic guidance 
and the luminal flange under endoscopic guidance. I favor the metallic stent because of the less steps involved in insertion compared with pigtail stent insertion. After a month, the cyst collapsed. However, there was no resolution. The metallic stent was then removed and replaced with pigtail stents. The procedure was difficult but doable. The stents were then removed after the resolution of the collection in two months' time. Our take-home points for today, take care of your patients, don't rush. Four weeks is a long time, and most of the cysts we, we see tend to resolve on their own. Options are available for necrotic pancreatitis, and each has its own advantages and disadvantages. Be strict with your definitions, and for appropriate indications, Endoscopic treatment of pancreatic necrosis should be advantageous to a select patient. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, for the very informative lecture. So now we are on the question and answer. And I'm going to start with uh, Jonard. Good afternoon, Doc. Yes. So how, what would be your criteria or your way of dec deciding whether, when, and what to do for cases like this? Uh, so usually, uh, so usually we, we take care of the patients during the acute phase as discussed earlier. Uh, we follow uh, guidelines for, uh, for treatment, nutrition, and everything else. And then we follow up the patient over time uh, after discharge. And then eventually we, we now come with the complications which come in. So there's a necrosis in there or a cyst, a pseudocyst, then, then the question lies whether the patient is symptomatic or not. Then once the patient is symptomatic, then we decide to intervene based on the choice of the availability of expertise and the availability of materials. So we have had some patients, uh, and of course, eventually we need to have, a, we usually do the multidisciplinary uh, meeting with the surgeons, the interventional radiologists, the GI and the infectious specialists as well to check whether which, which is the most beneficial to the patient based on overall, including the cardiologist as well. So it has to be a total package that comes along the way because uh, certain, uh, certain patients have certain limitations in terms of their capacity to withstand an intervention. Okay, lucky are the centers who have all these uh, facilities available because some of the hospitals locally don't have, I mean, sometimes they don't even have all three, right? Yes. So as you mentioned, the multidisciplinary approach would be the most appropriate, actually. It's the most ideal. Now, can I have something from Dr. Uh, Jonathan? Okay, John. Yes, no problem. Oh, sorry, for the same question? Yeah, well, the question for you is, when would you actually shy away from a surgical approach? When you, ah, I think that's uh, quite easy to answer because surgical approach just like, well, I'm talking about necrotizing paratitis, but uh, currently, just like any gastrointestinal disorder, surgery should be uh, relegated to a last option, if at all possible, with only a few exceptions. So therefore, uh, exploring the more minimally invasive modalities, uh, percutaneous catheter drainage uh, included, 
as well as endoscopic drainage, given necrocytomy. I think that should be the first uh, choice, if at all possible. But uh, fortunately, not in all patients is that possible. Number one thing you have to consider is, is it available? If either are available, then uh, the next thing to consider is the anatomic location of the necrosis that has to be dealt with. Uh, many, uh, uh, many endoscopies worldwide actually, uh, with a few exceptions, if there is extensive necrosis all the way into the retro peritoneum perinephric area, uh, and to a lesser extent the parapolic waters, uh, they would not do it uh, percutaneously. Ah, I'm sorry, in uh, endoscopically, and therefore in those cases surgery may be the first choice. But uh, for the majority of cases, fortunately, I think they are amenable to either percutaneous drainage or endoscopic drainage first. That's how we decide. Yeah, if you have patients with a lot of necrosis everywhere in the, in the entire abdomen, that is the most scary thing. Yes. The question is, does surgical necrosectomy still have higher pancreatic fistula rate when done transgastrically? Right, uh, at least for the initial, uh, there are actually quite limited studies on necrosectomy in general. Uh, limited, uh, large uh, number of patients uh, I'm talking about. Uh, but at least for the initial series of transgastric necrosectomy, uh, the advantage really is uh, uh, less external pancreatic fistulas. Uh, there are pros and cons. Uh, cons being like, you can imagine the transgastric approach as uh, similar to an endoscopic transgastric approach, except that there's an incision in the abdominal wall. And therefore the limitations uh, in reaching difficult uh, areas is still there. That's the main limitation, but really the main reason for doing a transgastric approach is to limit the the pancreatic fistula, and yes, it, uh, it decreases the external pancreatic fistula rate. And the other disadvantage is to get to the transgastric posterior uh, uh, gastric wall, you will have to open the anterior gastric wall. So there is theoretical risk of uh, another fistula from that incision on the anterior wall, although this is actually quite uh, rare in gastric surgery, unlike uh, colon surgery or small bowel surgery. Okay, thank you, Jan. Now, a question for, for Rick, Dr. De Castro. Your first catheter is, I mean, what size do you usually use for the first one? For your first drainage? Ideally, sir, uh, at least a 14 French. Uh, 14. Yes, sir. Uh, especially if it's a, mis uh, if it's a mixed uh, collection. Uh, if we see components that are non-liquefied, and uh, we could always upsize it uh, if the drainage is not optimal. Uh -huh. Well, among the three, surgical, endoscopic, and radiologic, I think the easiest to intervene would be the radio radiologic, right? <laughs> <laughs> Although, sir, uh, an anatomy is still a very important uh, factor. But <laughs> okay, a question for, for all three gentlemen. Once you have your percutaneous or your endoscopic stand or surgical drains in place, what would be now your guideline, like when the attending, who is an internist or, or non-GI, non-surgeon, would ask you, when do, we remove, when do we remove the stents or the drains? Can we have Rick first? Oh, uh, as long as the follow-up imaging uh, shows resolution, uh, so uh, CT is important to monitor the, uh, the resolution as well as the output. Of, um, catheter drainage also, uh, the external drain has the benefit of uh, irrigation, so it, it could help in uh, expediting drainage as well. So you, you sort of wait for until, uh, I mean, the drain is a zero, and then the... And then imaging to confirm. Okay. okay. Now, uh, Jonard? Well, uh, so we are usually dependent on the uh, follow-up radiology. So a, a follow-up CT scan will always tell us whether the, uh, the, the lesion has already resolved. So if the necrosis, and then the other thing is that when you do direct necrosectomy, you, when you go in, put the scope into the, uh, into the cavity and you debris, and after, after sort of repeated debridement, 
you're going to find pink healthy tissues already. Uh, initially, you're going to see all the necrotic gray, grayish, blackish tissues. And then eventually, once you, when you go back in and then take away those de necrotic debris, uh, eventually you're going to find uh, pinkish uh, healthy uh, tissues. So that, between that one and then the collapse of the, uh, of the cavity from radiology, then you will be at least confident enough to remove the, the, the stent already. Uh, unless it's earlier specified if there's already a risk for bleeding and then uh, usually when you put the, the metal stent for two weeks, then you have to think twice again. Of it. Uh, so in general for surgery, actually in any case, not just, uh, not just uh, pancreatitis, when, whenever we put in drains, we look at the, or we monitor the drain output. Uh, we do not do any imaging until uh, the output is decreasing so that there is no actual fixed time. Um, I think that is one uh, disadvantage of doing an endoscopic uh, necrosectomy is that you cannot monitor any drain output and therefore an imaging is almost routine, I would say, uh, within, within a specific uh, period of time. And that is generally around three weeks. But for surgery, we wait until there is no more uh, drain output, and then we may or may not repeat the, the imaging anymore for two reasons. One is that already uh, was said. No? The second reason is even if there is a persistent uh, uh, fistula, but there's nothing coming out from the drain because it is clogged, then the, uh, there's no reason to for that drain to be there. We might as well insert a new one already if there's persistent uh, fluid uh, accumulation. So there is no specific time period. We just monitor the drain out. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we have a question here, Dr. Rick. Uh, the question is, what is the success rate of catheter drainage or percutaneous drainage and what proportion require subsequent conversion to endoscopic or laparoscopic necrosectomy? Uh, for the output, po, it's very important with the character of the follow-up imaging. Uh, uh, the drainage is very reliant on the initial imaging. Po. If it's uh, predominantly non-liquefied, we forego catheter drainage and resort to the treatment with either endoscopy or surgery as immediately uh, if, if the patient can tolerate it. But for the drainage, um, not too much studies are available regarding the success rate, but there have been cases of resolution. Um, some prefer to drain first, observe, and if the patient does not respond, it's the only time they uh, step up to a more aggressive uh, therapy. Um, another advantage po, if uh, drainage first would be to be allowed to culture the, the collection while allowing initial drainage of the collection. And if it does not resolve, even with upsizing the catheter, that's the time we uh, proceed with a step up uh, debridement. Okay, thank you. We have a last, last question for Jonard. Question is, when you remove the plastic or metal stent, guided by follow-up radiologic aging, of course, and uh, the absence of output from the drain, do you give antibiotic or extend antibiotic coverage to the patients? Yes, uh, we do give the antibiotics. Uh, that's why, uh, as I mentioned, when we punctured it, uh, we, we aspirated and sent uh, the specimen for cultures. So that will actually help guide us in uh, what kind of antibiotics will we give. And then, uh, yeah. And then when we remove the stent, we give uh, antibiotics as well. For uh, to uh, as prophylaxis for against uh, uh, systemic infection. Thank you, Jonard. Okay, I'd like to thank all the panelists for this uh, session. Now, in the interest of time, we are already 35 minutes late, so we have to uh, move to the next segment. Thank you very much. The last topic for today is about surviving severe acute pancreatitis complications. 
So what happens after that? Our speaker is none other than Dr. Edgardo Bondo, who graduated from the University of Medicine of the University of Santo Tomas. He obtained his residence training in internal medicine and fellowship in gastroenterology at the St. Louis Medical Center in Quezon City. He had his training in therapeutic endoscopy at the Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong. He is a fellow of the Philippine College of Physicians, the PSG, and the PSD. He is currently an assistant professor at St. Louis College of Medicine, William Quasia Memorial. Let us call Dr. Rondo. Good evening. Uh, may I have the my slides, please? Uh, presenter's view, uh, Maui. Hello. 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 So, uh, sorry for the delay. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and for the invitation to be a speaker on this very important topic. Continuing medical education is more important now since the COVID situation has sidetracked discussion of other just as important diseases. My topic is surviving severe acute pancreatitis complications. What happens next? This is the outline of my talk. I will discuss the different sequelae of complications of severe acute pancreatitis, management of exocrine and endocrine insufficiency, and the quality of life among survivors. In approximately 20% of patients, a severe or complicated course of pancreatitis develops, which is characterized by early or delayed systemic and local complications. In severe acute pancreatitis, mortality can reach up to 50%, which is in contrast to a total mortality of 2 to 5% for all forms of acute pancreatitis. While our symposium is about severe acute pancreatitis in general, in alcoholic acute pancreatitis, there is a recurrence rate of 33% to 46% and between 12 to 16% will progress to chronic pancreatitis. Acute recurrent pancreatitis may be seen in hypertriglyceridemia, untreated biliary stones, hypercalcemia, and others. This, in theory, may progress to chronic pancreatitis depending on the severity of the episodes. 
this slide, which I picked from radiology, radiology assistant demonstrates the phases of acute pancreatitis between the first week to second week, during which complications like infections are to be watched out for, including the onset of prolonged organ failure. It also illustrates the types of pancreatitis, namely edematous and necrotizing. At the bottom, however, are complications regarding fluid complications, which have been discussed. So you could say that acute pancreatitis may, divide, may be divided into the first week, second week to fourth week, and subsequent weeks. Surviving pancreatitis, therefore, is not limited to the acute phase. Again, I got this slide from Radiology Assistant, which shows the mortality rates after mild and severe necrotizing pancreatitis which ranges from 1% to less than 1% to 15 to 25%. What follows after surviving a severe acute pancreatitis? Does the story end there? So let us take a look at what happens after an episode of acute pancreatitis. In this study, uh, they aim, in this study, the aim was to investigate the progression of disease from acute to chronic pancreatitis. During a 20-year period, 532 patients who were hospitalized after an initial attack of acute pancreatitis were followed up for an average of 7.8 years. Here we see that the relapse rate after the first pancreatitis attack is associated among alcohol, I mean, here we see that the relapse rates after the first attack is highest among alcohol-associated pancreatitis and even increasing through the years. This may be due to the fact that alcohol ingestion was not stopped. Among patients with alcoholic pancreatitis, the cumulative incidence of chronic pancreatitis was 13% in 10 years and 16% in 20 years. After a first attack, in patients with recurring alcoholic pancreatitis, the incidence rates at 2 and 10 years after the initial relapse was 38% and 42% respectively. Recurring attacks leads to a shorter period of developing chronic pancreatitis. These are risk factors for developing chronic pancreatitis. Smoking, alcohol intake are the stumbling blocks since these are vices and are difficult to give up, recurrent attacks, as mentioned, uh, is one of the risk factors as well. For today, I will discuss mainly the sequelae of SAP, namely endocrine pancreatic insufficiency and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. First, let me show you the relationship of the exocrine and endocrine pancreas. The islets of longer hands have a distinct arterial blood supply with an in insulo assigner portal circulation. The exocrine pancreas receives a large part of its blood flow through the islets, therefore, is normally exposed to high concentrations of islet hormones. Insulin, in particular, is essential for the functional efficiency of assigner tissue. Diabetes resulting from acute pancreatitis is termed pancreatic pancreatogenic diabetes and or type 3 C diabetes. Uh, the pathogenic disease involves the following. Failure to in digest in proximal gut leads to impairment of incretin secretion which leads to decrease in insulin release. There is loss of beta cell mass and loss of islet alpha cell and pancreatic polypeptide Decrease in results in decrease in glucagon secretion, leading to brittle diabetes, which is the hallmark of type 3C diabetes. Pre existing risk factors for type 2 diabetes complicates treatment of type 3C. The problem is that type 3C is not readily recognized by physicians. While chronic pancreatitis is a main cause of type 3C diabetes, cystic fibrosis, hemochromatosis, and pancreatic cancer may also cause type 3C. Of course, they all involve loss 
of irre and irre irreversible loss of pancreatic cell function, not just insulin resistance seen in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. In this system systematic review and analysis, 31 relevant studies with a total of 13,894 subjects were included. The authors performed the systematic review to determine the incidence of new onset diabetes mellitus after acute episodes of pancreatitis and compared the rate of diabetes mellitus in acute pancreatitis based upon different disease characteristics. The incidence of diabetes after acute pancreatitis according to POS. There is an increased incidence in alcoholic pancreatitis compared to biliary causes, which is the mo most common cause of pancreatitis in the Philippines. Whether this holds true in our country will have to be a subject of research. In a comparison between severe acute pancreatitis and mild acute pancreatitis, there is a higher incidence in the former. This may be, intuitive, in, may be intuitive already since more pancreatic parenchyma is involved. The presence of pancreatic necrosis is also a risk factor for diabetes mellitus. Pancreatic necrosis, of course, is also associated with a severe form of pancreatitis. In summary, overall, diabetes mellitus developed in 23% of all acute pancreatic cases. Severity, alcohol, and necrotizing pancreatitis increases the risk of diabetes mellitus in acute pancreatitis. Type 3 CDM is distinct from types 1 and 2. Type 1 is associated with autoimmunity, type 2 with obesity, while type 3 with chronic pancreatitis, cystic fibrosis, pancreatic resection. Pancreatic insufficiency is seen only in type 3 diabetes. Notably, the decreased polypeptide response accounts for the brittle diabetes seen in types 1 and 3. As illustrated in previous slides, endocrine insufficiency is present in patients with acute pancreatitis as well. However, in general, they are seen in patients with chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis is caused by alcohol, ingestion, chronic, obstructive pathology, autoimmune pancreatitis, tropical calcific pancreatitis, and hereditary pancreatitis. Not listed is recurrent acute of attacks of acute pancreatitis, which in most cases are associated to failure to stop alcohol ingestion and smoking. There is data about acute pancreatitis progressing to chronic pancreatitis. There seems to be a, a disparity between patients with acute pancreatitis developing chronic pancreatitis and among chronic pancreatitis who has a history of acute pancreatitis. This may be due to problems of reporting of just increased or just, just increased awareness and diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. Now these are the uh, diagnostic criteria for type 3 C diabetes. There are the major criteria, presence of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, pathologic pancreatic imaging, and absence of type 1 associated autoimmune markers. Minor criteria are impaired B cell function, no excessive insulin resistance, impaired incretin or pancreatic polypeptide secretion, low serum levels of lipid soluble vitamins. The following tests are important in diagnosing uh, type 3 and should be done even during the acute episodes of pancreatitis and during follow up since type 3 may occur during and after acute pancreatitis. These are uh, fasting blood sugar, uh, H, uh, HbA1c, the oral glucose, two hour oral glucose tolerance test, insulin, fasting insulin levels, islet antibodies, polypeptide response to mixed nutrient ingestion, fecal elastase 1 
uh, levels and imaging. Uh, I have the on the other portions of the uh, table the normal and uh, their interpretations. There are no specific recommendations for the pharmacologic management of type 3 diabetes. As pointed out before, it is associated with a brittle glycemic control. There is controversy as to the use of insulin as it is suspected to increase the risk of pancreatic cancer. Metformin is therefore the drug of choice. In this slide is presented the principles and strategies of management which includes prevention of hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, exacerbation of malnutrition, malabsorption, comorbidities associated with diabetes. Uh, regular meal pattern with regular starchy carbohydrates, do not skip meal, take small frequent meals, measure glucose levels frequently, avoid alcohol and smoking, ensure adequate uh, uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, minimize high sugar glycemic control, consider a diet, diary to record diet, and routine dietitian assessment and monitoring. PERT is important uh, not only to uh, improve exocrine function, but improving exocrine function also improves uh, control of type 3 diabetes. Because of the brittle nature of glycemic control of type 3 diabetes, a type monitoring of blood sugar levels have been suggested, uh, which includes uh, minimum 6 to 10 glucose testing of patients per day prior to all meal snacks, occasional postprandially, before bed, after physical activity, in the presence of suspected hypoglycemic symptoms, after treating for hypoglycemia until normal glycemia is maintained, and before critical tasks like driving, swimming, using dangerous equipment. I will discuss next exocrine pancreatic insufficiency after acute pancreatitis. There are two relatively new systematic reviews on EPI after acute pancreatitis. The study by Wang, which I will present, compared EPI prevalence in the first admission of acute pancreatitis and follow-up, while Holman's studied EPI during follow-up only. At the outset, it is noteworthy to, that both studies had substantial heterogeneity as to be expected since testing for EPI is very variable. In this editorial by Salman published in Digestive Disease and Sciences, he listed the following as causes of EPI and their relative frequencies. Note uh, that in acute pancreatitis, more common uh, EPI is more common with more extensive necrosis and those with alcohol or smoking as etiologies. Therefore, treatment should also involve uh, management of smoking and alcohol in intake. Similar to endocrine insufficiency, exocrine insufficiency may be present on index admission for acute pancreatitis. This is seldom realized by most doctors caring for acute pancreatitis and do not test for it. This is a comparison of the incidence of EPI during index admission and on follow-up. The number of EPI uh, was almost half on follow-up, which suggests that there is recovery of the pancreatic function, but also indicates that EPI may persist in most cases, in some cases, even in the absence of chronic pancreatitis. They also compared the relative risk of EPI on admission based on cause of pancreatitis, biliary versus alcohol, and on severity of, pan of pancreatitis, severe versus mild, and there is no significant difference, although you can note the wide confidence interval. 
pulling the results for studies with follow-up showed higher uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficient prevalence for severe compared to mild pancreatitis and for necrotizing and infected necrosis compared to edematous pancreatitis. There is also an increased risk for developing EPI after index admission in alcoholic pancreatitis, severe as well as necrotizing pancreatitis. The authors recommended the following. EPI should be tested uh, for all patients with acute pancreatitis before discharge for index admission, irrespective of the predicted severity. Uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy may be considered for, for patients with persistent EPI. Retesting for EPI of treatment should be done at three months after discharge in all patients. This is an algorithm for suspected pancreatic endocrine insufficiency. The most available test is fecal elastase, which if less than 15 is indicative of uh, pancreatic uh, enzyme insufficiency and if over 200 there is no PEI. In between results imaging may be helpful depending on the presence of uh, main pancreatic duct dilatation and calcification. Management of EPI involves use of pancreatic enzyme, enzyme replacement therapy of about 25 to 50,000 units and increasing the dose if necessary. Proton pump inhibitors may also be given to augment the efficacy of PERT. The more difficult task is convincing patients regarding lifestyle changes like cessation of smoking and alcohol, which are vices and therefore hard to abandon. Dietary control is also essential and again, may be difficult to achieve. Follow up is essential Follow-up is essential since both the API and the alcohol leads to, to malnutrition. In patients with an explained weight loss, search for a possible malignant cause should be done. In this study, they tried to determine the quality of life among patients who had acute pancreatitis by using a survey tool that SF12QOL. Patients who had acute pancreatitis had poorer physical component scores, PCS, and mental component scores, MCS, compared to controls from the North American Pancreatitis Study 2 control group. The presence of abdominal pain, analgesic use, smoking, and disability at follow up were important factors associated with impaired physical and mental Q, uh, quality of life after acute pancreatitis. This slide shows the predictors of death after acute pancreatitis, necrotizing pancreatitis after discharge and long-term follow-up. They are mainly age, persistent organ failure, and if there is greater than 50% necrosis. The figure on the right shows that more patients with acute necrotizing pancreatitis develop some form of disability on long-term follow-up. So, in summary, patients with acute pancreatitis may develop long-term sequelae, which includes exocrine and endocrine insufficiency. Endocrine and exocrine insufficiency may be present even on index, index admission or acute pancreatitis, and on follow-up even without chronic pancreatitis. There is low index of suspicion for exocrine and endocrine pancreatic insufficiency during admission and on long-term follow-up. Patients have a poorer quality of life after severe acute pancreatitis. My recommendation is to do more studies uh, are required since most of the, of the studies are heterogeneous. Local studies are necessary because of the different etiologies of acute pancreatitis compared to most published literature. 
Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Bandok. My, uh, I have a question here for patients who have suffered from SAP. How, how early do you start uh, enzyme replacement? Actually, there are no there are no studies, but I, you know, during uh, this lecture, I have thought that maybe we should actually do some studies on starting. Uh, PERT, even in acute pancreatitis, uh, given the fact that sometimes uh, we do not uh, test that uh, for, for pancreatic and endocrine, exocrine and endocrine insufficiency, uh, the question is whether giving, doing PERT early will actually diminish uh, the the severity or uh, the prognose or make better the prognosis of SAP. I think uh, we should look at this as a study. But I don't I don't uh, normally initially or routinely use PERT. Uh -huh. Okay, if you have a patient who is let's say symptomatic and you have started with him with earth, how fast or how slow do you accelerate or increase the dose in case you are not satisfied? Well, uh, I, again, this is probably going to be a, a gut feel answer. <laughs> and as they said, you have to look at whether there is diabetes, whether they have symptoms uh, of uh, exocrine dysfunction, like for example, uh, diarrheas, bloatedness, etc. So uh, uh, what is important is that you must know that the exocrine improves endocrine control. So having said that, even in patients with difficult control of uh, their type 3 diabetes probably will need uh, PERT as well and maybe an aggressive PERT because you know PERT is very little side effects we have here a question from Dr. Ang the question is is there a way to differentiate acute punk from the first episode of chronic punk well uh, in most cases, uh, as we all know, that chronic punk is probably irreversible, okay? And one is, uh, in most cases with chronic punk, we, 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 we should have some imaging uh, abnormalities as well. Uh, uh, both your CT, your MR, and even your old, uh, endoscopic ultrasound will probably help. Uh, and this next question is about uh, does patients who are newly diagnosed or with newly onset diabetes mellitus should they undergo cancer pancreatic cancer screening? Yes. Sorry, heart? sorry. Does patients with newly onset diabetes should they undergo pancreatic cancer screening? New onset, uh, yeah. having had uh, acute pancreatitis before. No, no just diabetes. Just diabetes. Yeah, should be uh, under well, if they have weight loss, which is usually also, uh, which is also uh, seen in uh, in diabetes mellitus alone, and but also if you have uh, acute uh, exocrine insufficiency, because they are usually uh, they are usually. Uh, uh, associated with chronic uh, pancreatitis but I guess in an elderly patient with new onset uh, there is no harm for screening uh, since we really don't know when they have had the diabetes 
okay uh, but if we can really probably uh, document that it is a very new diabetes without uh, without any evidence of chronic pancreatitis I, I think uh, not necessary but as you know diabetes uh, uh, obesity are actually risk factors for cancer of any type okay so again it's not very very expensive to do the test i guess i would okay thank you dr bondok i have to end our q a now and, turn... and thank you for ending it <laughs> 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 and we go back to our host <laughs> thank you very much for everybody who came for this afternoon after Thank you to our moderator, Dr. Ivan Ong, and to all our speakers. And that concludes today's PSG Single Topic Conference on Severe Acute Pancreatitis. Don't forget to mark your calendars for our next upcoming webinars. The PSG Council on Functional GI Disorders invites you to join a five-part webinar series. Next webinar will be held on December 19th of this year, followed by February 6th. February 27, and March 6 of 2021. The Hepatology Society of the Philippines, the Philippine Association of Hepato, Pancreato Biliary Surgeons, and the Philippine Society of Medical Oncology invites you to Liver Run, Virtual Run and Walk. Registration is on November 3 to January 5, 2021. Grace period will be on January 2 to January 29, 2021. Save the date for the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology's Virtual Postgraduate Course Series Part 3 on January 2021. And of course, the Philippine Digestive Health Week will be happening on March 8 to 13, 2021. See you all on our next upcoming webinars. Again, thank you to our moderators and to all our speakers, and thank you for attending the PSG Single Topic Conference. To officially close the conference is the Chair of Committee on Council and the current Second Vice President of PSG. Good evening. Let us all welcome Dr. Alan Polimparpio. Thank you for attending the Philippine Society of Gastro. Good evening, my dear colleagues and friends. Thank you for attending the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology Single Topic Conference with the title, Severe Acute Pancreatitis. I would like to thank all the people who made this conference possible. First, thank you to our moderators and speakers for continuously sharing their knowledge and for the flawless delivery of their lectures. I would also like to thank the organizing committee of the Council on Pancreatic Biliary of the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology who made this webinar a success. I hope that as we take our steps towards the advancement of technology, we also progress into better healthcare providers by consistently updating our knowledge. I look forward to seeing you all again in our next upcoming webinars and online conferences. Thank you very much. Have a good night and God bless. Thank you, Dr. Alan Policarpio. Once again, thank you for attending PSG Single Topic Conference. Have a good rest of the day and good, good evening. evening. My dear colleagues,